and share screen. Let's share screen number one. All righty, I'm going to start with this um, for the beginning here. And give me one minute. I'm going to go in and take these notes that I did. And I'm going to delete them. And I'm going to draw that. Give me a second. Uh, I have two things I need to do real quick. I want to grab, I had some reference earlier. Um, and I'm going to get that back up. And... Um, why do I keep having? Cool. Let me get the cam windows back here. Yeah, normally I, I'm home a little bit early and I could log in, but I had a faculty senate meeting today. And I was there. I had my class finished uh, at two. I had meetings with students till three. I had to run across campus to get to my meeting. And then my meeting went from three until 5.30. I literally drove home, got home at 6.15, 6.20, started breading chicken for the kids for dinner, finished, <laughs> went upstairs real quick, washed my face, came down, made a Greek coffee, which is a very strong type of coffee drink. Uh, known as frappe and uh, now I'm sitting here loaded on caffeine ready to sketch okay I do want to expand my frame a little bit so let me do that really quick let me go here Bill, I have a question yes ma'am uh, this is totally random but me and Claire were kind of wondering what kind of coffee you usually get at Starbucks when you go sketching <laughs> um, oh my god <laughs> it, it's there's either one or two things I get 90% um, of the time I get what's called I call it liquid cheesecake it's it's like a a caramel frappuccino, or it's the now they changed it called a ribbon crunch. I usually get it with two shots of espresso inside it, and it's like a blended coffee drink that has nine hundred calories in it. So it's equal that's so to sugary. Having, it's huh? So sugary. I'm surprised. I know that's what I mean. It's it's way. I have a problem with sugar. Like I try to avoid sugar, but when it's there, I take it, and then I get all wired. Some people get tired. I don't get tired whatsoever. Um, let me put my glasses on. I can't see a damn thing. So I'm going to expand my canvas. It is a little uh, little too much sugar. But sometimes if it's early morning, I just get a normal cup of coffee. Um, and uh, what I really like is I have some really good teas. If I go in the afternoon to go sketch, I like getting that that sort of dragon tea or it's like a pink tea. You know what I'm talking about? Is it the strawberry acai? No, it's a call. I think it's called dragon fruit something. It's really good. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's it's quite delicious. So. One second. Let me just. I want to expand my frame out a little bit. Image. Um. So it, those are usually. I like a creature of habit. I like that caramel ribbon crunch thing. But man, is it just like, it, like you said, it's all sugar. You know. I, I leave there and I feel like I just had an in and out burger. It's so much sugar inside it, you know? But it's tasty. I have a sweet tooth for caramel. And when I'm out and I saw that, like, like they put the caramel drizzle on it with the whipped cream. Oh, my God. It's, like, so delicious. So, yeah. Do you have those, uh, those square caramel cubes that you get in little clear wrappers and you just chew those oh yeah the welches or the yeah the ones that start the with rocks the branches yeah, oh. i don't want to show you what a sugar holic i am i have a stash in the other room of like heath bars <laughs> a stash of of like uh skittles uh or starburst skittle gummies sour patch kids gummy bears and i i try to mm. avoid it and stay away from it and then like once a week I'll grab like a little mini handful of sugar. But see, sugar affects me differently. Sugar is, for me, is like instant energy, you know? Um, mm -hmm. if, that, if that makes sense, it really is. It's, um, it gives me lots of energy and makes me hyperactive. So um, 
it, how, I don't know how to explain it. Like so, some people have sugar and they go down. When I get sugar, I'm like ready to go run. You know, I mean, I'm, I get that. And I love it. It's hard for me to get in the mood to draw sometimes, especially it, it's taken quite a few years to get used to and accustomed to drawing while I have uh, students in a classroom, you know, because you have to stop and think and then clear your mind and stuff a little bit. So um, take some time and practice. But um, what's funny is my daughter has my, my sweet tooth too. And I got to admit, like I love when I go out to a restaurant after a good dinner, I like having something really nice and sweet. Uh -oh. Really pretty yummy. I'm going to draw another version of this. I'm going to just throw it out here real quick, and then I might come back to it. And um, it's already getting a little large. So let me make it a little smaller. I'll go smaller than that. Okay, what's going on? I'm making there deselect. Um, I used to just drink like lattes, you know. Honestly, we thought that you just like straight black coffee. No, not black. <laughs> I always, I have a sweet tooth. So I always have to have like cream in it or a pack of a uh, sweetener of some kind, you know. Yeah. It, to me, that. Flavoring makes... syrup. Or what? The flavoring syrup that they can just dump in there. No, I've never had that. Never, never what? tried that before. No. Huh. Yeah. Surprising. Because they have. I used to work at Starbucks and one person one time ordered like 12 shots in their latte. I was just like, oh, this isn't good. <laughs> no, that's not good. That's heart attack city, right? Um, I'm a little rusty right now because I was drawing characters today so it's going to take me a couple of minutes to get back in the you know what i i give me a second i want to i'm using my i have this one seat the centic pen it's an oversensitive one let me grab my other one this one's too sensitive the other one's a little bit less sensitive and draws better All right, I'm back. Sorry. My kids just informed me that I made my chicken too much seasoning, so I'm like, great. I try to bite a little too much seasoning on it. Um, yeah, this draws so much better. I don't know what it is. So check this out. This is a like a hundred and eighty dollars Cintiq pen, and it's it has like higher levels of sensitivity. This is the base model. It's like 80 bucks. And this draws so much better than this one does. This one's like way too sensitive. Like I can't get thick and thin lines out of it. It's just so much harder to sketch with, you know? You, you could adjust it though, right? I, I, I could if I go into the settings menu. I just, um, I had it adjusted. And then what happened, Raphael, is I did an update on my computer the other day and all my settings disappeared. Oh, reset. And then that stupid ass Windows, um, what do you call it? Ink came back in. I'm like, gotcha. oh, come oh, on. No. Not this again. They re added. Huh? They re added that? It, they haven't like officially got rid of it. It was back in part of my update again. And I was really bothered by it. 
I can't scan the darn thing. It's just that was the last thing that screwed up the tablets. Right, I know. The time pretty... when they installed that, every Windows computer filled with drawing. People were not happy about it. Oh, it, it, I've had problems with it at school when they do an update. I've had major issues with it as well. I'm forgetting some of my my approach to this. Give me a minute. I was, I'm attaching them in the wrong place. When I drew it last time, I was attaching from the outside. Now I'm attaching from the middle. So I'm making mistakes as I'm going along in this. I need to fix them really quick, and I'll do that right now. It felt weird when I was drawing them. Why does this feel so weird? That's why I had the wrong pen. But what happened at school is I have to bring my pen now because someone's been stealing our Cintiq pens. I'm a little bummed. You know what? Did I tell you guys what happened over the summer? Someone stole both of my Logitech cameras from school. That really bumps me out, you know? Because I don't get reimbursed for that. It just comes out of my pocket. Very, very oddly specific things people are stealing these days, I've noticed. Like, I hear stories about people going and stealing, like, the most random stuff. Like, really? You had to steal that? Yeah. I, I don't know why people are, are doing certain things. You know, it doesn't make any sense to me. Here's my thing about stealing. And I was a little thief when I was younger, you know? So here, here's my, my thing about it. it. If you really have to steal because you need something that bad, just come tell me what it is you need. And I'll find a way to get it for you. I'll steal it. No, I'm just kidding. I'll, uh, I'll, I, you know, I get money. I get lotto funds, and I just got awarded. I think I'm going to get a thousand dollars. Every instructor gets a thousand dollars. I think a little bit more than that. Um, yeah, I wish, right? Um, yeah, I was sort of bummed that they did that. And then Frank and I were counting up the pens. And we've already, since school started, someone's already came in and stole a couple of pens. I'm like, really? It's the other thing, like a Cintiq pen. Like, okay, somehow the person who stole the pen has got a Cintiq in the first place. It's my guess. Uh, why would you need to steal the pens for it? Unless you're trying to resell it for students. Who knows? I I don't know. That's it, often what happens. They steal it and then resell it thereafter, not the thing itself. Well, you're not going to get much. It's not like Cintiq pens are hawking for tons of money. You know what I mean? They're, they're really not. So. I mean, I guess they are also easy to steal. You could probably... Well, you know what I think it is because this happened. One of our our lab aides that was working in the lab accidentally took one home and then lost it. And then I was like, "Dude, you got to pay for that. Like, you need to go buy some new ones." Still, I have students that are going to need a pen, so you need to go figure out how to replace it. Like, so I'm not trying to be a jerk, but that shape is not working. I'm going to change that. You know, honestly, I'm willing to bet that's what it is. Because, like, funny thing that happens every now and again, I yeah. uh, sometimes I'm looking through like stuff. Like, I found like gathering dust in my closet when I'm like doing like a deep clean, and I pick up like a uh, a small book and I open the front cover and it's like property of like my my first grade that's elementary right. school because I like yeah. at home. <laughs> I know what you're talking about. I've done that too a couple times by accident. I've stolen so many books that way. I feel so bad. Yeah. And I'm not doing it on purpose either. It's just I lose it. I hear you. Hey Phil. Yeah. Uh can since I like literally just joined the class for the first time, is it okay huh? if you give me just like a
a quick briefing of what we're doing? Oh yeah, go to the blog. You, mm -hmm. So go go to the blog, which is fcr. Excuse me, fcr one forty three dot blog. Oh, I'm in I'm in the canvas now. I got in the canvas now. Okay. Um, well, I'll just you can type it in too, or it's on the it's on the syllabus, but it's fcart143.blogspot. Go to the mm -hmm. blog, and what the project we're doing is a world building assignment. And then go over to Google and flip through some of the students' work. What we were doing is drawing independent views of plants, and that then I'm going to finish this demo. Then I'm going to organize it inside an environment. And mm -hmm. if you look at mm -hmm. The assignment is called World Building. It's an, it's an assignment that Art Center College of Design does. And if you go take a look at the blog, you'll see what I'm aiming for. So I'm doing a demo right now, and I'm just adding another plant here. And then I'm going to go in and start to put this on an environment. You know, and then um, if I have some time tonight, I'll try to also um, start throwing some tone in and um, addressing that too. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. And I'm sorry, um, Preston, I will be around this weekend. If if it confuses you, just let me know. Um, I already have a meeting tomorrow with a student around 10 or 11. I can meet with you after that. Or if you want me to meet Saturday, even Sunday morning, I'll, I can jump in. Unless I go to the zoo. I was tempted to go to the zoo Sunday morning if I could steal my wife's car. Because she has a... A Route Four. I don't want to drive my diesel truck all the way down to uh, LA. I mean, from what I'm looking at on the blog and the Google Drive right now, we're kind of just like sketching a bunch of ideas of like cool trees and plants and stuff, and then exactly. like putting them into like thumbnails. Exactly. We're we've actually just been sketching them, seeing what. So let me show you. Here's the one I'm working on right now. I did this demo on the left. I'm adding another tree here so I can put an environment. I'm going to frame it, resize them, and then build an environment around it. And this is sort of that purpose of world building. Okay, hold on a minute. And then right here is another demo that I did the next day where I was doing like a, I had this idea of like a turnip with legs like a spider. And it mm. would look like it's sort of maybe walking with these large leaves. So I tried combining like three plants. I combined a radish with organic legs from like the south or from a, a, a the willow trees have big arches like that in in the south by louisiana and then i come and then i enlarged the size of a leaf from like a standard tropical plant and put those all together trying to show what i could come up with from taking three different things and merging them and i think that inspired some students then uh ran with that and started coming up with some really creative ideas with like, you know, sponge trees and trees with, with arms that look like like bugs or spiders. And we were just having a lot of fun with it. And that's where we are. Okay. Huh. Okay. All yeah. right. All right. So and our goal will be what I was wanting to do is try to get students feeling comfortable drawing an independent plant to where then they can start to take that plant and merge it into an environment was my idea. Yeah. And because that, like we did in basic drawing, some people in this class never had the basic drawing class that you had. We did plants, and then we talked about organics and grouping. So today, for some of these students, that's sort of the direction we're going into. I'm going to start creating groupings from my plants that'll start creating dedicated compositions. Mm, okay. Okay. I'm also seeing that some people are doing like rock formations and stuff too. Yeah, so it's exactly, I was just going to comment on that. It's not just plants, but it's also bushes. It could be, you can think about different clouds. Rock formations are huge because whenever we have organic worlds, we have rocks on different levels and all kinds of stuff like that, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, does that help a little bit? Yeah, I think I get the idea. Thanks, Phil. Okay, oh, you're welcome. And everybody, that's Preston. He's joined us, so thumbs up. Um, and um, it's going to be a pleasure having him. He's a really good draftsman. He works really hard, too. So I'm really glad he's going to be in this class with us. It'll be fun. All right, I wanted to bring this other, this one's getting a little larger than I wanted it to do, but I, I like the direction it's going into. So let me bring it down a little bit here. All 
I don't know. I was really tempted to go to the zoo on Sunday, but that's like an, if I go to the zoo, that's like a, a huge all day thing. And it's like 20 bucks to get in, you know, but I think it would be fun. I only go to the zoo if I want like sugar covered covered almonds with cinnamon. <laughs> Ooh, what was that? <laughs> I said I only go to the zoo if, if like I'm craving like those sugar covered cinnamon almonds. Really? They... <laughs> I've never tried those before. They're really good. Are they really? Huh. Dang, that sounds really yummy. I could never go to the zoo and draw. Mainly for the same reason why I can't go to the zoo and actually learn anything. Because go to the, like, they have the little pedestals, right? And I want to read about the animals and stuff. And it's like, oh, man, I always feel this pressure that I have to keep moving because everyone wants to see the animals and read stuff. So I can't really. <laughs> Screw everybody else. That's what I say. I, I oh. have no. No, I do. I'm like, I'm there. I paid my, you can sit and. I got to deal with their little punky kid jumping on the fence and making noise and coming over and bumping me, you know, and <laughs> doing a hundred other things. I, you know, and I'm a zoo do donor. I donate, I don't know, probably, I don't know, a hundred bucks a year, not too much, but it's still a donation to them. Cause I used to go there. I really enjoy sketching. The San Diego zoo is amazing. The San Diego zoo has some of the best grounds I've ever seen in terms of plant life and organics. It's just absolutely stunning. It's really, really cool. Um, what was I going to do? If, if the cool thing about um, sketching at the zoo is actually when people see you doing it, they give you the space. So that yeah, exactly. Pretty awesome. They do leave you alone. Except for I get one of these. My nephew draws. <laughs> and, and then I'm like, oh, okay. And then I just sort of, you know, I, I, I try to be polite about it. And, and then if it keeps going too much, I'll just go, hey, here's my YouTube site. Tell your nephew to check it out. Send me an email. And then I go. And then sometimes I get the lady that just keeps talking and she won't. And then that's where I, I've had to a couple of times just say, hey, um, I'm here for three and a half hours. And this is the only time I have. I would love to chat another time. Here's my card. Email me. I need to spend my time drawing because it cost me 20 bucks to get here. It was $35 in gas. <laughs> Because gasoline's now six dollars a gallon in California, um, pretty much, right? You guys have seen it spike, right? It just went crazy. Yeah, it's five fifty nine in LA right now. Yeah, and then it's funny. I have a diesel truck, and but I get to run biodiesel in it, so it's twenty like twenty percent vegetable oil from McDonald's. And um, actually, I for having a truck that's lifted with 37-inch tires on it, I'm getting 18 miles to the gallon, which is actually pretty good on the freeway. But um, it doesn't work well for driving to the zoo. So what I'll usually do is try to steal my wife's car or uh, my son's little car. This little RAV4. The re Some people are like, well, why'd you get a diesel truck for? Well, because you wouldn't know this, but I also, um, outside of being a teacher, I uh, am in the property management business. So I have a place that belonged to my dad's that I manage. And um, uh, I have to manage a um a place where a couple of buddies moved out of the state and then my wife has a little place that we rent so sometimes i'm driving around and then i do a lot of camping so when i go out to go camping that's a huge thing for me is having i need a, a truck to tow so i i didn't want i used to have two vehicles i used to have a truck and then a commuting car and i didn't want to do that anymore because it's it's more money on the the trip uh, I'm excuse me on insurance and then trip and traveling it's double the cost so I just got a truck and said hey this is going to be my main vehicle from this point let's leave it simple and I'm actually really looking forward to going camping 
because the weather is going to change pretty soon. I was just talking to a couple of my buddies. And uh, one of the guys I go with, who's a really uh, four wheel drive genius, um, he just got hired about a year and a half ago at Rivian Electric Vehicles. And um, he is helping Rivian design their electric vehicles to be off-road beasts. And um, he gets to go on all these trips and show them how to like climb hills, how to get out of the sand, how to race them through the desert. And yeah, I'm a landlord. Sorry not to discourage anybody. It just happened. And then, um, so I get to, I'm really excited. I get to go hang out with my buddy, Scott. And then he, he told me, I was talking to him on the way home today and he's all dude and he goes guess where i'm going i'm all where and he goes they're sending me to glamis you guys know where glamis is never heard of it oh my god go, go, yeah go. it's like sand dunes right and yeah go, go to youtube and type in glamis just type yeah that and you'll see what it is it's giant sand dunes the biggest sand dunes in california and they're all down towards mexico in fact when we're there sometimes we were there once and we saw a plane going under radar coming in and it threw packages out. We're like, uh, we better go before the drug cartel shows up. You know what I mean? So Glamis is a... Uh, Wait, how is it spelled? G-L-A-M-I-S. I can't believe it. That's probably why I don't know. I'm on my state. <laughs> Glamis is real known. Uh, oh, it's like pressed right up against Mexico basically yeah go go look at a couple of youtube videos type in this one type in ronnie renner glamis type that in and go look and see what he's doing or, or actually type this in type in um glamis jump over canal and you'll see what crazy Hispanic and white folk do when they're bored. Because those are mainly the two ethnicities that go to Glamis. The Hispanics are crazy, especially people from Mexico that grow up with um, off-roading. Like my buddy Jorge, they used to take me down to, um, I used to go with my buddy Jorge, who was from Argentina and his mom was from Mexican. We used to go down all the time to Baja, California, watch the races and some of their families would race and we would help them with like support trucks. And I've just been hooked into that side life type of thing. It's just fun, it's just something cool to do. And Viviana can confirm, right? Yeah. I mean, well, it's a huge, you talk about a culture shift. It's like, there are people that are really into off-road stuff. And did you guys type in Glamis jump over canal? You type that in yet? I have. Did you see the the guy take a buggy and jump over the water canal? Taking a buggy over canal. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's what people do in Glamis are freaking crazy. It's fun though. I think the best part. Do you see some of those sand cars there, Will? The uh, sand cars? Yeah. Type in sand cars, Glamis. Some of those cars are worth $250,000, $300,000. They're pure uh, off-road race cars. The fastest sand car to ever see Glamis sand dunes. That's probably a $400,000 car. Wow, look at that thing go. I know, right? <laughs> so, we dunes. R Rivian is a company that's about to start competing with Tesla, and they make an off road truck. And every, with electric motors, you get triple and quadruple the amount of torque. Every individual motor on a wheel produces 900 foot pounds of torque. Okay. That is an incredible amount of torque. 
that means that that truck can basically climb almost anything that it wants to. I get the feeling like if your car's screwing up or like if you're doing dirt bikes or something on those sand dunes and you crash, it probably wouldn't hurt as much. It doesn't. Unless um, I crashed once on my dirt bike in the sand because we put a paddle uh, tire on our bike and um, it just sticks. It doesn't slide as easy, but the sand's soft. So if you crash, one time I crashed, I kept sliding and my bike stayed and then it pulled my leg and I like stretched my tendon between my kneecap. Oh, but it's all right. I just had like three shots of tequila and some Motrin and I was good to go to go ride again. And then it, and also then it, hurt. The, it hurt for about a month. Yeah. Skin burning heat. Ooh. Right now it's hot in Glamis. But Glamis is crazy. People go there and just have a good time. Unwind. and But you see those sand cars, right? There are people that build those things. And um, it they look similar, but not the same as like drag racers. Yeah, but they're they're completely like fully developed suspension. Like it's like the uh, exact middle point between a drag racer and a truck. <laughs> yeah, sort of. Yeah, I mean they're completely. Uh, there's one company out here that makes them, and they make them for the U.S. military too. They'll make them and and then when like the seals have to go in, they'll have one of those cars and they just usually blow it up when they're done, which is sad. But they go so fast. There's a huge one for that. Especially when oh. they go to like Dubai. You guys know where Dubai is, right? Yeah, it's a uh, like by the United Emirates. Yeah. Yeah, like Middle East, like close to eight. So you have lots of people in Dubai that have a lot of money. And they, to them, it's nothing to buy a three or $400,000 sand car. You know? No, not when you live in a city that has gold bars vending machines. Yeah, that's true. Not when people are, are super <laughs> loaded, right? You can make your own island. <laughs> that city is crazy. Dubai is a fucking parody of a city. I know. Hilarious. You know what's funny is my buddy just went there because he has a um one of my friends is really rich. He's uh one of the top distribution companies of, of heavy duty truck parts for like trash trucks, anything diesel, um, you name it in California. And so he sells parts and now they're selling to um, Dubai and other places. And he just went there on a crazy business trip. And he was telling me things I just couldn't believe about that place. How much money there is. You know what's weird? You know what a status is there? Status there is eating at McDonald's every night. Can you believe that? Interesting. Wasn't McDonald's cheap? It, no, it's expensive. That's why. Yeah, I would imagine it to be like super fancy. Yeah, people will pull up at a oh. McDonald's and like a, uh, you know, like a Lamborghini or a... actually you don't see many of these here, but there's an off-road Lamborghini, which is crazy, you know. It's really a neat looking car. All right, what I'm going to do is take these trees now. And I like the one I just drew. I sort of imagined it being framed there. Um, I'm going to copy this one, delete that one, paste it back in so it's on a separate layer. I'm going to see if I can't scale it up a little bit and get it in here a little bit more in the foreground like this. And then call that tree L. And this will be the tree on the right. Once your trees are done, from this point, it's you can actually keep them on the one layer and then draw behind them and just have fun. So one of the things that I would recommend is just keep your horizon line very low like this. 
like that. And then you don't have to have the straight line in there. You can overlap it. And what I mean by that is you might have, you know, maybe there's a, like a rock, you know, here. So but, you basically using like the dominant plants and then drawing an environment around it? Absolutely. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then Oops. So now you got to think, what do you want to put in the back? And there, there's all kinds of things that you could do. Um, let's, it, this is the part where it's open rain. It's just about having fun, right? So you, you could create hills with other stuff on them. You could come in and like, I like this movement in here. Part of me was thinking like, what if I had another tree and a large leg? Like what if there's other plants? What if these are the baby plants of these plants? And then in the back here, there's other versions of them that are just like, you know. Big. Like <laughs> yeah. That'd be cool. I'd love, I, I want to do one of those environments where you just have like plants in the foreground that look big and in the background, it's just big. Yeah, so one of the things I want to do or what I would encourage you guys to do is when you're sketching like this, try to think about playing with scale and, you know, and, and really pushing the size of something. I remember you mentioned something. I don't know if you went through with it or not, but I remember you mentioned something about possibly throwing in like a, uh, like a, like a prop, like a house or a vehicle. Yeah, or something. I, I had that sort of not a thinking about a structure or an old dwelling or something. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. If you do that, that might help part of your focus a little bit. That's a pretty light, large tree there. And then my thought was, because that thing is so damn big, there's just this, you know. shape in here like that's another one or the the size of the tree What did you guys think about the glamorous world? Does it look crazy? I mean, we have something in our state similar to it. It's not as intense, but the great sand dunes over yeah. here. Are pretty cool. Yeah, what are, they, what are they called? I've heard about those before. It's just called the great sand dunes. <laughs> yeah, there's there's been a, a couple uh, pro riders that go out and jump those things in Colorado. They have in Utah. Too. Yeah, a lot of times people just go there with sleds and stuff, pull down them and whatnot. Yeah, um, I'm a little iffy on that. That thing takes up a lot of space right there. It makes it a little bit more complicated. Um, I don't know. I'm tempted to delete it now. I sort of like the legs in the back. I might. What do you guys think? Should I keep it or take it out? I'm on the fence about that one because it makes it really busy and it eats up. I'm going to take it out. It eats up a lot of space in there. Well, how I would see it is if you look at the other plants you made, the leaves aren't that close to the roots. So it wouldn't make a lot of sense to see the whole thing, but maybe you'd see like a little bit of it on the top. Yeah. Maybe you see a little bit. Yeah. Like that coming in through a little. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's that's a good idea. And then let me erase. Okay. Um, and then in the back, oh, there's so many different variants we you could do, you know. So um let me do a staggered environment like this. Like, what if this is water that's coming through here? And this is what I was thinking for staggered. That was there. Let me put another layer. Maybe it'd be something like this. What if there was? It's trying to keep low horizon line. And I want to avoid, I want to go with something tall, like rock, sort of. Maybe different, but like these huge, like giant. rock formations. Man, there are some cool rock formations out there. I'll tell you what. I know. I, I need to go and Maybe there'd be like a waterfall back in there. First time you did this project, I got a little confused. Did what? Because I thought you to draw every part of the environment as a separate thing but it just looks like you're taking two major plants you've already drawn and then you draw the rest of the environment around it yep that's exactly what i'm sort of doing and now or, or you could do the other thing you could also draw a background and then fit your plants in around it too there, there's never mm -hmm. i think that's the thing with all of drawing or design there's never one answer you know you you come up sometimes with different ideas right and then they encourage one after another type of thing yeah yeah so i was like that's why i got confused the first time because i was thinking man i got to draw every single piece and then put it in there but you don't have to draw every single piece ahead of time hmm Okay, I'm drawing and nothing's coming out. There it goes. Hold on, I'm drawing and lines aren't coming out. There we go. Oh, Sully, I tell you, why do you keep coming in here? Is that your cat, John? No, it's my little dog. He okay. always scratches at my door to come in. Yeah. I let him in. 
Look at the door. He's your, he's your buddy. The door. He's your buddy. He wants to hang out with you. Well, it's the thing. He doesn't. Because he's uh, he just doesn't like closed doors. So I'll close it. And he's outside and he's scratching. He's like, I want in. And then I let him in. He stands there looking at me like, well, are you going to come in or not? Reluctantly comes in. I close the door and then he's immediately scratching to want out. I'm like, what do you want? <laughs> well, it makes him feel happy to know that you're there. So then he wants to go do something else. I think it sounds that, a lot like it sounds a lot like cat behavior too. Cats do that. Yeah. He kind of acts like a cat. He uh, rubs his face on you and stuff. He's a little odd. I'll let you out. Come on. There you go. Yeah, they just love to be around us. They want to make sure you're there. My, I would be in here teaching, and my little pug would come bang at the door, and then I'd let him in here, and he'd pace, and then he'd want to leave, and I'd be like, dude, make up your mind. Like, what do you want to do, you know? And... For the most part, it's not a big issue, but I really hated it because I, I cannot sleep with my door open. I can't. I, I cannot sleep with my door open. And there's some nights where he does that like one, two in the morning. I'm like, oh, oh my goodness, just let me you know, sleep. Pets, pets do that. But then one day when they're not around, you're like, oh, I miss, them, you know. Oh, yeah, I agree. Um. Oops. So I finished this one, like with waterfalls in the back type of thing. And I'm going to do another one. Let me get another idea. I sort of like that large plant idea that I was doing before. I'm just curious if I continued that over and simplified it. I tend to make things really complicated where they shouldn't be. So I need to walk away from something, you know. So... Hold on a minute. What layer was that tree on? Was it midground? Nope. That was foreground. Not that one. Not that one. That oh, was one. What was that one? Okay. Um. Give me a minute. Let me look at reference. Get another idea. When you do uh, like demos and stuff in class, do you always have reference up? Yes and no. Depends what it is. If I'm looking for a shape of something like a tree or a rock, you know, there's something I need to look at to, to guide me a little bit, you know? Because today think. in prop design, you were drawing the desk. Yeah. That desk in prop design, you were throwing bunch of different reference like different props in there i'm like oh are you looking at reference you just remember no, that, that was just that, that's just from years of drawing uh environments and stuff mm. i just think like that after a while no that's just from like actually that's from like being around spooner and and talking and putting stuff on sets you know what i mean it's just you you get in there and just sort of start working you know yeah yeah and i build all that up over time god spoon is a genius dude the way he would draw and come up with ideas you know always wondered like you know I, i'm not sure what your stance on this is because i've heard different people they have different opinions on but kind of that difference between um uh, talent and skill and this idea, like oh some people are just naturally gifted with certain things and other people have to develop it through hard work um i th to me there's like three different things there you know actually even more mm -hmm. um Some people are late bloomers, if that makes sense. They, I'm a late bloomer. Mm -hmm. Some people do very well at things, and they just dive into it and become these like monster talents. Paul Felix is like that at a, at an early age, you know. 
Yeah. And then it, it, this is how I would look at it. People will interpret things different. There are some people that are really talented, but they don't have enough confidence or belief in themselves. And sometimes mm -hmm. it takes time to get that belief system going. So they learn to build up confidence in themselves. And yeah, it, it could be a variety of things of, that you don't like about yourself. And, you know, hold on, I want to pull up one more piece of reference. Sometimes it's, I really think, the, you know, I, I, you know, not to get all weird on you, but the way we grow up psychologically and around our parents really affects who we are because mm -hmm. it, it changes the way you approach life. Um, and sometimes when things change in your life or, I don't know, people come and go or you you take things for advantage. Sometimes you don't know how good you have it and what you have until you, you don't do it or you stop working, you know? Um, and you, as an artist, you learn to reapply yourself sometimes. Like you go through phases and the way that you believe about yourself and stuff. And I really think that that has a lot to do with because I've seen artists that have skill and then they don't apply themselves because they're extremely negative. So I think that's the one benefit I have as being a teacher is seeing all these different students come through the program over the years and some do well, some do poorly. And some will hmm. it could get a job and then they come up with a hundred reasons why they can't get a job. You know? Yeah. And um, I don't know, I, that's, to me, that's the stuff that I notice is people are skilled and have a good background, but some people don't apply themselves because they don't believe in themselves. Hmm. Um, another thing that happens is some people develop egos and then they start thinking that their shit doesn't stink anymore. Excuse my French, but they start thinking that they're the best at everything. And one thing I learned from working in this industry is that there's always somebody that you're working with that's better than you. And the, the guys that are humble that just draw because they love to draw tend to do very good and tend to do good in life. And I'll give you an example of a couple of those guys. John Navarez. That guy just loves to draw, man. He's friendly. He's nice. He's not a backstabber. He just enjoys being around other people. You know, he wants to just make good work and just be around friendly people and enjoy the experience. He's a positive guy. Michael Spooner. Positive guy who enjoys helping other people. Robert St. Pierre, positive guy, just likes to, to draw himself. He was trying to work as a designer and work himself into a good position of being a designer. And then the teaching thing for him sort of happened, you know? So it's how you use your skills and abilities. I'll give you a good example. Because I'm going to talk about a student in this class, Ashley. Because I remember when Ashley was first in my class, she struggled a little bit and had a hard time. And now she's freaking killing it. Like everything she's doing is like home run, home run, home run. And if you were to go back maybe a year or two ago and ask her, you know, she saw herself getting better, but what if she just decided to give up and stop doing it? And a lot of people do that. They go, oh, well, 
I didn't get it, or this is what I wanted to do. You know, they go like, I wanted to be an illustrator and I wanted to illustrate covers uh, of Dungeons and Dragons manuals. And I'd be like, well, you might have a hard time doing that because that's not as as busy, I guess, as a career, I would say. You know what I mean? Um, actually, mm -hmm. here's a, a good example. One of my former students that left and went to a very prestigious school in Florida. I went out, he came back to California, went to go have coffee with him. Super nice guy. And we were hanging out and stuff. And I asked him a couple of questions about, um, like, what are you doing? Like, you finished? What are you going to do? And the, the school he went to was really good art school. But one of the bad things of this art school is that they would let you do what you sort of wanted to do a little bit. And I think that became a negative, maybe where he stopped making like good portfolio pieces. You know? Mm. Maybe they encouraged him to draw anime or something. I don't know. He just started going in his own little route. And then when I hit him up about like, well, what is it you want to do? Or what do you want to, what do you want to become? And then he's like, well, I just want to do these types of characters for the games, the game industry. And I said, you just targeted a window that's that big, like a size of a dime on a, on a freaking cork board versus all these other categories. And I said, you might have a really hard time pursuing that, you know? And he goes, I know, but that's just what I want to do. And so I was just sort of like, well, if that's what you want to do, then do it. But to me, why not go the other path? and look at what people want and what's busy and then focus on that stuff, you know? Right. Yeah. Why I understand? Choose, why that. choose I mean, a small window I... of fantasy characters if nobody's hiring for fantasy characters? That's what I don't get. So here's students got a tremendous amount of talent. He's really good at applying himself, but then he chooses a window. That's like the hardest freaking thing to get into. And then if you get into it, the game industry has been sort of like we hire and fire, hire and fire, freelance only. So there's not too much longevity in that, right? So mm -hmm. why, I don't know, I just trip out like why pursue that then, you know? But, you know, everyone pursues their own type of thing, I guess. And I mean, I'm kind of that, like, I'm not too big on drawing sci-fi and stuff but like if i were to you know like sure i'd say fantasy is more my wheelhouse but even then like you can do games you can do animation children's books there's a lot of areas that deal with fantasy you just have to uh be open to them i guess now what I would say, what I told him to do when I gave my advice, I said, that's like, I just told him, I just, I'm going to try to be honest with everybody. So that's like throwing a dart into a bullseye five times in a row. So the chance of you getting that fantasy gig and job constantly is going to be very hard. And I said, why not target this is your primary job and then do the fantasy stuff on the side and see how that develops. You know? Or if you're if you have multiple skills, like maybe if you know how to write stories and stuff, write your own book and illustrate it. <laughs> and then you could have all the fantasy art in there you want. Well, exactly. And, and But even in doing that, I would do it separately to see how it, where it takes you and how you develop your skills, you know, right? Yeah, yeah. You want to put all your eggs in one basket. Exactly. And and that's the thing I noticed. So, you know, you you students get better at different rates. Some people give up some people don't give up ashley's killing it right now she's doing a great job claire's doing a great job um raphael's killing it lots of you in this class are doing it i'm seeing improvement go june is killing it she's getting better taha was killing it all last semester and before so people start getting better and they start going up and i see them getting up and getting better and then sometimes people will just be like and they put on the e-brake i'm like why are you stopping and they're like, well, I don't know. I just got tired of plein air painting. 
I'm like, how'd you get tired? You're doing such like bitching ass work. Why would you stop? Well, and they, they lose faith in their direction. And when that happens, it I think it affects lots of things, you know? Oh, I know. I know that very well. You know, there's been seasons life too where I'm looking at the stuff I'm doing and I you know it can be very easy to compare to other artists like who are younger your age you're like man they're doing way more than I am and a lot faster maybe I'm in the wrong industry or you just get discouraged and you just think there's no room for me here is there you know and and what you just said right there is that part where the brain gives up and where people get up give up you know what I mean yeah they're, they're doing well yeah. and you can be like this close to something and then all of a sudden you give up and here's the other thing too that I've noticed a lot about people because I was sort of the same is you're around negative people when you're around someone who's really negative and they throw out like a real like yeah like you're ever going to do that or like oh yeah like that's going to happen and they do something like that that can really knock you down like personally inside you know I, I remember once somebody yep Somebody said to me, it still rings in my in my head. It's why I get up and work sometimes. They're like, dude, you're a layout guy. You'll never be a character guy. And people have, I've had a couple of people say that to me. Like, you just stay your thing. You're really good at, at doing layout. And you're really good at camera angles and perspective. You focus on that. Don't you focus on doing other stuff. I can. It's always the negative voices that replay on our head so easily. No, it, it totally is. And then I look back at that sometimes, and that is, for me, becomes fuel to then want to get better. Right? Fuel for the fire type of thing, you know? That's actually one of the reasons why I really want to learn how to draw people and characters and stuff, because I know for years, you know, I'd make good environments, but I'd look up illustration jobs and they'd say, oh, we need knowledge of anatomy and character design. I just say, yeah, I'm never going to learn characters. So I guess I'll never be able to be an illustrator. And then I just walk away. And it's like, I'm really tired of doing that. Well, you. People. It's a natural reaction to be afraid of failure. Mm -hmm. Because. I know people that won't even date other people because their self-esteem is low and they think they will never meet somebody. And that's a shame when you see that happen. Okay, I, I have a neighbor who's like a totally nice guy. And he's like a maintenance man, engineer guy. He worked for Carl's Jr. forever. And then he just wrapped up the last 12 years working for uh, in and out Burger, and he just retired. Mm -hmm. He sits around in his car and makes old cars and restores them. And he has a, a nice house, nice guy, and he never has, he doesn't have a girl. And he's not, he's not gay, which I was hoping he would be gay because he would want to be by themselves for so long. And, you know, he's just He's maybe he's one of those guys who just want to be by himself. I, I know what it is, but it trips me out. Like, don't you want to have like a partner in life or someone to be around? And it's he's just content sitting around, like not really having anyone, if that makes sense. I say I imagine like if he was really if he's fairly old, you know, or well, he's maybe he doesn't old because he just doesn't have any anything in his life type of thing, you know. Maybe he thinks he's ugly or something and no one would fall in love with That's him. That's what I, I mean. Know. Exactly. He has a negative belief system or something about himself. And he's such a nice guy, dude. He's really, he has so much to offer somebody. And I know a couple of people that are like that. They just have bad self-esteems in themselves. You know? So that question, John, is a good question because I've seen so many different things i've seen wasted talent you know i've seen people that 
have really great skill and then they throw it away for nothing. And then I've seen the opposite. I've seen people that are really talented or, or pretty talented or medium. And then they have these huge egos and attitudes. I've seen people that are very skilled and they go around thinking they are God's gift to design, you know, and you're just like, I don't know. Uh, ego is ego is kind of scary because um it is it's very honestly scary. it it's frightening when someone actually makes a lot of progress like you go to a job and people start praising you and you put out really good work and then you feel like you got to defend your position you got to defend your title and then you get really like ah, about things and criticism and it but that's that comes back that's like human interaction 101 that's like, mm -hmm. you know, I was reading a book once. It's like, you know, the guy who's the main hunter out of the group. And then later on, he gets to be 40. And then another kid who was 18 becomes the new hunter in the group. That's fast and he's swift and might do something different. And then the guy that was the original hunter in the group now gets jealous and he gets, he gets angry and feels cheated. And then negativity happens because he can't deal with his emotions you know it's kind of like you kind of like greek mythology too you know like absolutely the, the gods like fearing their or the titans fearing their children and for you know fear of overtaking them right you literally named the plot of the crudes <laughs> if you remember that movie Did you watch? Did you watch the Croods? I I see it. I like I've seen well because I know that it's been out for a while, but for a good while I was really put off by the design, by like the character design, um, and mm -hmm. so I didn't want to watch it. Yeah, the design, but, the characters were a little weird, weren't they? Yeah, yeah. I, I felt like just a little off putting for me, but but I I guess I I saw the trailer and I saw the environments and the color. And it looks really like good and vibrant, and so now I want to watch it. Very beautiful, and I'd, I'd say the characters are okay, but the environments are what makes that movie great. Yeah. Um. Clear my brain for a minute. Crude's two wasn't as good, I don't think, but it was still decent. It, I, to me, what's funny is. So much of like art sometimes is being around people, you know, no, you got to understand people. Like I was talking to this one instructor at school, you know, saying something about something about drawing and this technique. And she like cuts me off mid sentence and goes, Oh yeah, I know that technique. And did that. And that meant showed to me that she didn't know the technique and she was trying to act like she did. And then she got very defensive about it very quickly. And I'm like, hey, if you have to get defensive and we're having a conversation about a freaking pencil, then that's on you. You know what I mean? There's something wrong there, you know? So, you know, everyone, that's how I look at it sometimes. There's people I worked with in animation that were nice and friendly. And there are people that would backstab you in a second for a job, um, you know? And you just tend to hang around the nicer people. Last of the Greek coffee there. Okay. Let me see. What else? Uh, should I do one with the other one? So this is what I did so far, just to recap. I, did, I had this waterfall idea with like a large tree sort of in the back. Okay. Um, I sort of like that. And then I was going for this castle idea, like a ledge with some built castle or something on the back coming down towards the water. And it's surrounded by trees. I was thinking maybe that's why the castle's there. It's surrounded by this thick forest so no one can ever attack there like armies can't get in then I, then when i was doing this one i started thinking about that el dorado the city in the lost forest type of thing then it was too big so i had to yeah. scale it down get some clouds in there you know um type of thing so anyway um yeah john that's such a good question because it you know it's I can, I can just tell you guys a story. Like, I had this one guy in my class, this Korean guy, and um, he drew really well. And, man, this guy just had horrible confidence in himself. 
And and then one time he was in my class, and then he dropped my environment class. He he was barely turning in work, and it was him and this other guy. And then he dropped the class, which was a sad. And then went and paid nine hundred dollars to take the class at brainstorm. And and I heard he took the class at brainstorm, and then he got out and he goes, "Well, I didn't learn anything there either." And I thought, well, the problem is wasn't brainstorm or me. The problem is your attitude. Like your attitude is negative. It's pessimistic. So he's a pessimistic person that carries a pessimistic attitude around himself. And my attitude has always been different. My attitude is like, you know, if I have a dull conversation with somebody, I still might learn something from that conversation about that person or about myself that might enrich my life. And that's the way I look at it. And, you know, that, you know, and I, I don't know. And then I remember that that student, these two male students were around a female. Well, the female has done really good. She's moved forward. She always worked hard. She always believed in herself. And she's now, they were equally talented when I had them like 10 years ago. So that student now is working at a game studio and doing really well. And then these other two males are just like still slumming around, getting a freelance job here or there, like barely getting by. And they could have made it and been really good, but they didn't believe in themselves. And you can see that come out in the way that they walk and the way that they talk. I hope that sort of makes sense. So, you know, that's why I talk a lot about that in my classes is somewhere in our field, you as an individual have to make a decision on whether or not you're going to go for the gusto and whether or not you're going to be talented at it. And then, well, the other thing you have to do is self-analysis, you know, can you look at yourself and, and ask yourself, what are problems you've been doing? Maybe it's sleep. Maybe it's staying up late. Maybe it's dealing with stress from a family member, you know, um, maybe it's, a form of alcohol, alcoholism and partying too much, you know, those are all like real so. legitimate things that people suffer from, you know? I think the hardest part about that isn't necessarily, um, recognizing what the problem is. It's like, okay, you recognize what the problem is. Now do something about it. And it's like, okay, how? <laughs> Sometimes it's like, how do that? It, it, it how do you even just conjure up the willpower to do that? You know, it's like, where does that come from? I I think my buddy Victor said it best once is he made a comment once when um a long time ago when I was younger, your guys' age. I was dating this really pretty pretty Irish girl. Her name was uh, Colleen. And um, and then what happened is I thought we were going to get like engaged and get married. And then a guy that I knew that was like a secondary buddy, not one of my primary buddies I grew up with, I found out that they were having an affair and that they were seeing each other. And then it ended very nastily. Nasty. Mm. And then when it ended... I was like, I was crushed. You know, I, I didn't want to do anything. I just wanted to sit around. I wanted to drink. I just wanted to, to not, I didn't want to draw. And, you know, it was like a, a real negative. And um, my buddy Victor made a comment to me once. And he goes, you're at the bottom of the barrel now. And he goes, now you know what life is like at the bottom of the barrel. When you've lost trust in someone who was close to you, when you, you don't want to do anything. When, and he goes, now... He goes, you can't, he goes, you had your month to deal with this mentally. And he goes, now you need to go sit and focus and work and draw and you'll meet somebody else and you can't walk around with your head down anymore. He told me that. And I remember, this is why I remember is he, he sat down and he goes, I'm going to play a song for you. And he goes, this is my way by Frank Sinatra. And he played that song for me and then it like resonated with me when he did that. And it made me think about how 
I need to to get out of that slump. And it's such a bitchin' song because he talks about being in the dumps. He talks about changing, you know, and then he talks about being on top and living his life. And there's what I learned was, and you know, I learned that my mom was a little bit of what we call a codependent. And I had that trait in me to want to take care of people, but not take care of myself. And I think it was really important for me to go through that. I always believe like things happen for a reason. Going through that breakup, feeling miserable, finding your buddy who was like your your body surfing buddy. You know, you spent years together hanging out. We played cards together and your buddy screws you over for a girl, you know, right? And yeah, it, it made sense to me. Now it makes sense to me later. At the time, it didn't make any sense to me. Um, and it, it totally did. My buddy Victor was right. He was like, dude, you were so down in the dumps. The only way to go up was the only position to move was up. And he was right. And then I started learning more about just like, applying myself into my work and then focusing in myself and then i started noticing things that like codependent people do that are not good you know like getting in relationships and letting people dominate you and when i mean by dominate you i mean by saying like you know be home at this time you need to do this you need to do that and you know and i saw i had buddies of mine doing that and as soon as i met a girl that was like, where were you last night? Who's that? Who's that girl you work with? Huh? Huh? She's pretty. Huh? You, is that one you work with? And as soon as I encountered that, I was like, later, I was gone. Because I didn't want to deal with that level of negativity because that person had problems, if that makes sense. And then I realized that as I went on, I'm like, I've been dating the wrong girls. I kept meeting these like BB girls. They're all like, you know, the BB clothing line and they're shake your heads like this when they talk and stuff. And I realized like those were not the right type of people that I wanted to spend my time with, if that makes sense, you know? Um, and then I started, um, it's still a popular brand too. I started reapplying myself and looking for different people. I was looking for people that had more success in their life, people that had, gone out of their way to build a future to have things and, and stuff and that I think some of that changed my approach so in some way being down in the dumps was a good thing because it taught me about respecting myself it taught me not to let people take advantage of me it taught me not to trust people that I knew like this one particular guy, I knew he was trouble because he had a reputation for being trouble. And I knew in the back of my my mind, I knew he would do something like this. And he did. And I don't know, to me, you have to go through an experience like that. So whether it's art, getting knocked down, whether you feel really horrible about something that you did, art related, whether it's feeling like you didn't draw for a couple weeks or a month or a year, and then you come back and you feel really horrible, sometimes is like artists you have to have those feelings happen because you have to figure out if you are going to be a survivor and come back stronger or are you going to let your negativity overcome you and that's a, a, a life question some people let it overcome them you know and some people refuse to do that they will not let something like that dominate them and overcome them. Phil, have you ever met anybody who has let that negativity overcome them over and over and over and then eventually just said, no, no I'm done losing this fight and actually turned around or not? Turned like, have around. you seen people? Most of the people I know have overcome it because they started to believe in themselves. And I would tell them something or give them advice or or they would give me advice and then you you overcome it. You realize it's worth fighting for, you know, right? Yeah. For me, I think it was being around my mom 
because my mom used to always say stuff to me like, honey, like you have a talent. Don't give up on it. Don't don't be a cop. Don't do this or that. Focus on your your skills, you know, keep growing. You know, and she's like, ever since you're little, you're always drawing, you're always making something, you're always being creative, you know, and don't, you know, and, and I don't know, there's something cool about that to me. When I look back at that, everyone has a parental role, you know, um, well, everyone's going to think that everyone's going to feel that way when you see other artists. But then again, that's that's why you talk about self comparison. It's self comparison is the easiest ticket out. It's easy just to go, oh, oh, that person is better than me. Well, shit, I'm just going to give up. And then you're like, you go back and you listen to people talk. Like, I I remember listening to Martin Luther King talk, and I'm like, God, that guy is just so eloquent and so well spoken, and he's just talking about things that make total sense. And I'm like, dude, that guy has nothing to gain. And that's something I learned, like. Some people, it's like a poker game. Some people, you can bluff and they don't believe in themselves, so they pull out of the game. And other people will stay in and bet you to see if you're lying on your hand. And and sometimes, you know, you could do that. Martin Luther, to me, like listening to Martin Luther King or other people that I find, you know, to be educated. I've always been attracted to smart, educated people that hold good conversations and think with rational thought. I have a problem with what I call sheep herders or people that follow the flock with what everybody thinks, you know? And, um, you know, there's, there's, I mean, lots of different people that I've heard talk and give speeches and stuff that are very interesting and very fascinating and I know they just give you. I remember listening to Charles Schultz give an interview once talking about how he went into Disney and, uh, excuse me, NBC because they wanted to do a peanut strip. And then he agreed to it. And then they started changing things on him. And he just sat there looking at all of them in the room. And then he just stood up and he goes, Can any of you draw? They're all like NBC executives and they're all, excuse me. And he's like, can any of you draw? And they're all, well, no, you're, 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 that's why we want to hire you and do your series on TV. And he goes, that's what I thought. And he turned around and walked out of the room. And then they called him like, why do, why'd you leave? Why'd you do this? You just blew a $15 million deal or what? And they're all like that. And he said, if they want it, they'll be back. Just sort of confidently, you know? Mm -hmm. and he was right and then when he made the deal to come back he put it on his terms and he said if you want to do this I will do it with you but I will be in creative control not you and you will not make creative decisions and change my comic strip around and I think to me hearing that story that to me that was cool you know to hear someone who had that belief system in themselves um who was it? There's this one motivational speaker I like listening to. This blonde, attractive blonde woman who um, said that like everyone would look at her for being a blonde. Like she was a ditz. You know, and then she really wanted to get into NASA. And people didn't believe her, her science, her ideas. And they wouldn't believe it. They would tell her stuff like, oh, you don't have a place here. You don't belong here all these negative people. And then she wrote some paper and, and did some tests and all this other stuff. And then boom, she was at NASA. And she looked back on it and thought of all those negative people around her life, you know? So. So what would you say like the, like the first step, not necessarily like the magic bullet, but what would you say would be the step in kind of overcoming that kind of negativity? Um, stop focusing on the emotion and focus on the action of creating, you know? Hmm. You, people create emotions. Being negative is a wasted emotion. You control it, you create it. It's the only emotion that has no positive from it. 
when when you're sad and you have a good cry, you feel better after that cry. When that girl, when I found out she was cheating and stuff, then I realized there's going to be no marriage. There's going to be no this. There's going to be no engagement. It's done. It's over. After I thought about it, I was actually a little happy because I realized all the red flags I was ignoring. And I realized, dude, she's going to be gone. And now I get to start all over. And now she's stuck with a guy who's an alcoholic, who's a womanizer. And that's what she chose over me. And I realized like, dude, let her have her picking. And it took me a month or two to get to that, to, to get to that level and, and realize that, you know? So yeah, I was sad. I remember being bummed. I remember like I had this ring for her and I just like, I couldn't take the ring back. So I just smashed it with a hammer, you know, through the, it was like a little diamond through that away or whatever. It was nothing fancy. And then later on when I met my wife, she's wonderful. She's smart. She's educated. She had a great career. She's the only woman I ever met who had no debt and she had her own apartment. That's one of the places I manage now. You know, she had all her shit together. She was gifted and she she just was a little bit different than other people because she was more of a homebody that likes to read books and isn't all into her looks and stuff. She's just real laid back, you know? And when you you have these emotions all human beings do and worrying is probably the most number one wasted emotion because there's nothing positive that comes from it. When you're happy, your endorphins release energy. When you're sad, you feel better the next day when you're not sad. Being negative and worrying is literally a wasted emotion. Nothing positive comes from it. It gives you stress. It gives you anxiety. It prevents you from performing. It creates stage fright. It makes you not believe in yourself. And when you don't believe in yourself, you're not going to be good for anybody else because you'll never be confident in your own manner, right? All those things come out of that emotion. You know what I mean? Of, of being negative. So mm-hmm. the way to counteract that no. is just go create, go draw. Believe in your, like I tell some of my students, when's the last time you invested time in yourself? And sat and drew for hours and hours, you know? When's the last time? Yeah, yeah. When's the last time you filled a sketchbook? When's the last time you went to the zoo and sat and drew or drew people? When's the last time you put value into yourself? So that's the problem with somebody who's codependent. Codependents put all this time and energy into other people. And then they always get the short end of the stick. And usually it's not your fault if you're codependent. Usually become codependent because when your parents were codependent. And then that behavior, you learn that between ages like four and 11, you are branded. That is your psyche as a human being has been branded by the interaction with your parents, whether you like it or not. And if there's a negative interaction in there or something like that, um, that you had to experience, like, like my buddy Jorge, you know, you know, his dad was nice, but take us to San Felipe. But man, when his dad got mad and was drinking, he'd whip him with a cable, like a real litter cable, a real cable. You'd like lock with a bite, like a thin one. And, you know, and, you know, when my dad, you know, he had a good heart and stuff. But when he got mean, he was emotionally abusive. He would say mean and cruel things to people, you know. And um, so... I think a huge part of art, and it's not just art, there's a crossover between music. Do you know how many people can play an instrument and then they never believe that they're going to be able to make it or go somewhere and they give up on it? You know, I know so many people that do that. It's the same metaphor with art. They start the music really good at guitar and then they go, well, there's already a a Van Halen. I'm never going to be better than that. And then, you know, there's already a Muddy Waters. I'm never going to play like him. Okay, so who said you have to be either one of those two? Why not become the next, what's the lead singer for Jet or for The Strokes, right? Two really, two good bands I like. Stroke and then, you know, um, you know, you, you could become your own thing if you believe in yourself. 
And that's the difference is people that really believe in the self go that extra mile and they keep doing it. And then what happens, you develop an unbridled confidence in yourself where people that tell you no, you just push it and you ignore it, you know, and you don't believe in it. So, and, and, and then, you know, I, I don't know, to me, that's the thing with negative people. As soon as I'm around negative people, I sort of put my, I put myself in reverse and I back up and I go a different direction because I know what the outcome is, is being around negative people. I've learned that through my life experience. So here's number one. I did the waterfall. I did that. What I want to show you, what I was hoping to do, and I, I've done all right for 840. I got three examples, right? I have no idea how I just zoomed in there. <laughs> I hit a button on my Cintiq and it just zoomed. So I didn't mean to go that far in, but um, let me try that again. Maybe, I don't know what the hell I hit. It just went on my Cintiq and now it won't do it normally. But so that was number one. I had this idea of waterfalls. What I was trying to do compositionally was think of this. What is opposite to the shapes in my foreground? My shapes in my foreground are round and curves. So if I throw straights in there, they'll contradict each other and then the streets will read. That was my initial idea in the back of my head. And I think that worked pretty good there, right? But then when I got up here to number two, I put more organics in there, liking the large trees. And then I immediately try to go to straights in the back because that'll make the castle pop. And so to me, that was important. Everything else will unify being curves. And I don't have any tone in there. Once I would have put tone and go dark to medium to light, then it would start to change a little bit more, you know? Um, then here, I I kept it sort of straights, but with a tilt on them, thinking maybe like large mountain with maybe rocks. But I sort of liked this flowing feel I was getting of mountains in here. And then... I don't know, part of me felt like trying to get another baby mountain in the back here, like like it was maybe like lightly coming up type of thing. But I wasn't sure if I'd be able to pull it off, if it would fit in there. You know, if these were like mountains that have been growing over time from water disappearing, you know, maybe there'd be something like that in the back. But then I, I feel like I may be putting too much. So then I just sort of want to leave it alone. What I like to do is do a sketch like this and then walk away, clear my head, come back later and look at it. So, but I would be fine with you guys doing this. If you take some plans that you did, do a couple of renditions of it. Um, I didn't, I didn't press hard, did I? I'm not rendering. So if that would be my goal for you guys is take, why don't you do three setups like this, and then just spend about an hour and a half, 30 minutes each, and then sketch in a background quickly. So you've already drawn the plants, create a setup. So when I mean a setup, it's the foreground with the plants in it, and then do this. Now, here's another option that you can do, because we were talking about this. What happens, oh, I haven't saved my file. Let me save my file, I'm such a dumbass. I'll keep working and then it'll crash and then I'll lose everything. Let me see. Do we have to um another version? Well, not have to, but would you suggest that we the three thumbnails we do, would you suggest that they all use the same plants and just modify like what you did, or can we use different plants for each one? Oh, I encourage you to explore however you want. What okay. I was gonna do next was this. What if I take off everything? And what if I just come in here? and start hacking up the paper and then come in and do the opposite, right? To every every positive, there's a negative, right? You know, your body pushes one way, it pushes back. In mathematics, there's opposites. In composition, we know there's opposites. So sometimes coming up with another idea might be as simple as you going in an entire, oops, another direction. So what if I did this? What if I came here and just went? I know I have curves. So what if I just start messing around with like large, tall trees? And seeing what I come up with. In fact, maybe these trees 
have some weird, I don't know, structure to it. Maybe they do hit the ground. Maybe there's heavy rocks. So I have very large, sharp rocks. Bill, I, I, I think, I think I asked you this once, but I don't remember what answer you gave. But of all the times you've worked in the industry, have you ever met people or students who have been successful that have had um, like vision issues? Like, you know, maybe they can't see or really bad nearsightedness or that they have like fairly strong disabilities to them and have they been able to succeed with those? Um, I, I, people with different disabilities, I mean, you don't really ask. You, I was around one guy that had really thick glasses, like my buddy Victor does. Mm -hmm. My buddy Victor was a kid. He had glasses that like an inch thick and he can't. Yeah. And he had finally, uh, what do you call it? What you call it? What's that eye surgery called? Like LASIK. Oh, the laser. LASIK. Thank you. Yeah. I was on the tip of my tongue. I just couldn't think of the long drawing. Um, and he had LASIK and stuff, and and then he had to have it. I didn't realize LASIK only lasts a certain amount of time, you know. Mm. And um, I I don't know about students, but there's like an artist. Um, he's pretty well known. You know. Yeah. Um, uh, Nathan Fouts, he, for some reason, he wears an eye patch. Uh, but like, he's a really good um, painter, like, yeah, background. Nathan Fouts is freaking amazing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he did a lot of It's great. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. He's a genius, dude. I didn't know he had an yeah, eye patch just, or something. I just asked that because one of the, like, all this talk about all oh, believing in yourself and stuff is one of the things that often down is, you know, I think, man why did I have to choose wanting to learn how to draw stuff like that when my vision sucks? It's like, I literally could have picked a less visually demanding profession. <laughs> but you're only looking at something this far away from your face. Right. That's true. So, I mean, that's, but it has an impact that's on like positive to me. You're not having to go out and look at airplanes passing by. You're not having to look at distance. Right. Right. But the, I was, I think I was talking to my mom about this earlier because I was talking about how, like, when I draw, when I draw the left side of an object, I can get better curves and stuff. But when I draw the right side, since that's like my weaker side, it, it's not as good. And there's some ways I can get around that digitally, but it's like, you know, it, it just, it, it can get discouraging when you think like, man, I got to fight in an industry full of people who've got two perfectly good eyeballs. <laughs> well, I eyeball suck. I have four eyes, so, and my hand hurts, so, and I get headaches. <laughs> so you're not alone. Thanks, Anna, That's good. for sharing that, because I think that's cool, because I, I have a problem now where my left eye waters, and I went and saw the doctor about it, and she told me, she goes, it's because you don't blink when you draw. She goes, draw something for me. Oh. I sat there doing it. And she goes, you haven't blinked for three minutes straight. And I'm like, I know. And she goes, well, that's why your eyes are watering. That's why you have a problem with your left eye, you know? And, uh, yeah, I when I was a kid, like, I've always had bad eyesight. Like, I remember, like, every weekend I'd have to go get testing for my eyes. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, you're not alone on that. <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, I, I think my right eye is pretty much blind. Like I can, it's ambulatory vision. You cannot really see out of it. So I, like when Phil was talking about the cone of vision and like, oh, we only got one eye and you only see like half the cones. Like, yeah, I know the feeling. <laughs> yeah, but what is that? That doesn't do anything. All that does is prevent you from doing jobs like being in the police or you need your peripheral vision, oh, yeah. being, being in the military or something like that. You know, you don't need that stuff. That stuff is not gonna make or break you as an artist you know it's not it's actually one of the reasons why i prefer doing digital over traditional because i tried doing traditional art classes and they'd have you sit up straight and draw which that hurt but also you have to like look at something far away since i always drew slightly at a tilted angle 
I'd always be like, oh, you got to draw straight, draw it straight. And it was like one of the worst classes I've ever taken. And I kind of want to get over that, but it that, was I, really disappointing. And I'm sorry I didn't get your email before, John. I was so busy. I didn't get a chance. To, and then I saw it and I'm all, well, of course you can work it. <laughs> I'm like, you know, yeah. I, I just was so I, busy the past couple of days. I think I think I know what I want to do with that, that class is I do want to work digitally, but some of the projects I'm going to attempt traditionally, not necessarily because like I think I'm going to be doing traditional that much, but because I just kind of want to get over that like negative, almost bitterness towards traditional art that that okay, first, first, first drawing. Off, class, I will say but, this. You got to try those pencils. I mean, every I know you keep telling me. Every student that draws with those pencils comes back to me and goes, oh, my God, I can't believe my my other student, my teachers are making me draw with a an HB. Yeah. And, and a 2B in a 6 page. <laughs> you know, I'm like, that's it's like pain and suffering. I'm like, I know. Right. You got to sit at a vertical easel and hold your arm like perfectly straight. And it's like, oh, my goodness, it was terrible. Yeah. Donna, honestly, you were kind of got me through that because I was so mad about that digital, that traditional drawing that I was like, dude, I need to learn how to actually draw. And I found your channel. I'm like, oh, man, this guy gets it. Really? Just from that? Pretty much. Yeah. Like, because I'm a very analytical thinker. And the guy I was with would just scribble on the page. He's like, we got to feel the drawing. I'm like, what the heck are you talking about? <laughs> That's like this one. There's this one instructor at school. She talks, when she talks about doing ellipses, she goes, just feel the ellipse. And it'll come out, feel it. And I'm all like, feel it. I'm all, what angles are that, dummy? You know, I'm like, just like, the, 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 you don't feel it. It's not a. <laughs> You feel something that gives you, stimulates your senses. Drawing an ellipse does not stimulate a sense. And 95% of people, it causes fear, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I don't know. I, I'm not the only one here. I can pretty much guarantee you is kind of cut off by some of the more fine art, traditional drawing classes. It's like, oh, man. I know. It, it's too bad, dude. I'm liking this forest idea, but then I'm trying to figure out what I want. I, I Let me bear with it for a little bit more. I'm sorry. It's taking a little bit longer. I'm getting a little bit into detail here. And I am not meaning to. I'm just trying to get these the, this feel down, right? Because th this is what I imagined in my head. Is here, there's a hill. But you can't get to the hill because there's freaking pointy rocks, like, everywhere. Even when you hit the base of the hill, and even another part of the hill, there's more trees. And then what I was thinking is when you hit that hill, there's a really tall structure or place up there that's important. So can I take one of the plants that I've drawn and throw it in the midground? Because I remember you hit one of them. It was the flower that was like trying to eat that vibe. And I was, and you said something about putting that in the midground and like making the foreground for it. And I'm like, oh, that's a cool idea. For five dollars. Five dollars. It'll cost you. I'll give you. I'll give you money. I'm just kidding. Of course you can't. You do what you what you want. Just stay within the guidelines and the parameters of the assignment. That's all. I will. I will. I don't know if this is working. I have this idea. Maybe here it'd be like a base. Maybe it's like a, a plane or something on it. And there's like other little starships like coming in to land.
like like a microverse or hey, what oh, I was I was gonna say is it like a microverse or kind of like where it's like or no, is that like Something popped in my head, like it'd be like a Star Wars platform, you know, and there'd be like a ship landing on it or something. Oh, you know? okay. And it's cool, cool. on a planet that's all. At first, I was going for a castle and I just wasn't feeling it. I was going to maybe in one of your drawings, make like a little city, like a village built into a tree trunk or something, or like in the. Be awesome. I know what you mean. Yeah. That's a cool, like a gnome city. Yeah, I like the gnome stuff. Still I looking for project. The, the, you don't even know. The gnome stuff. I cannot wait for the gnomes. Just waiting. Waiting for you to give us the gnomes. I know. Um... a little bit of a tangency there but I'm going to try to cheat it and then throw another counter angle in like that I don't even know what the hell I'm doing I'm just throwing straights in just trying to make a different composition go a different direction um, hold on let me do a couple more here Another, God, I'm actually repeating part of the same structure. I need to look at reference to break away from. Oh, I think I need to sacrifice a small hamster so I feel better about my work. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Phil said he's going to sacrifice the hamster. Blood. I like hamsters. I had one when I was a kid. And then it disappeared and it ran away. <laughs> I was like, why'd my hamster leave, man? You know? You didn't sacrifice it? No, it just left. It ran. I was sort of bummed. I was like, his name is Jerry. And he was like the coolest little thing. He was like a little fluff ball. He'd run around. He'd come over and sleep by you and he'd do stuff. And then he started eating a hole in the wall and like disappearing in the wall. He found out how to get out of his little cage. And then he found out how to get out of like, I guess, the room, the house. And then one day we, he was gone and we found him in the backyard. I'm like, how do you get in the backyard? <laughs> we couldn't figure it out. He must have just snuck around. And then I think he kept getting out. And then finally... He just uh he just disappeared. I feel so bad today. That alarm for email went off. It was super loud in the classroom and Will like had a heart attack in the in the classroom. It was sort of funny. Yeah. And then I was like, damn, that thing was loud. I'm sorry, Will. I didn't know that thing was gonna go off like that, you know? It's okay. You couldn't have known. I I had, it was weird because we we're talking to people like in the class and I didn't think things were that loud, you know. Man, whatever happened to the good old days of you got mail? I should get that again. Yeah, I know. I wonder if I can get my computer to. Oh, you totally can. It's like super easy. Oh, I, I want to uh, do that. Other computer, not my Mac. My Mac is a mess. Yeah, it's like super easy. You just like go into like your uh, those sound control panel. You can find a, and you can like, we find like uh where you can just change out your sound effects for anything else. Yeah, a buddy of mine put John Wayne's voice in his computer. That 
It sounds oh. hilarious. So like a sound effect. You can go like, what are you doing? And it's John Wayne. Oh, great. Someone's at the door. And it's John Wayne. It was pretty good. I could have so much fun with custom sound effects on my computer. I'm almost done, you guys. Let me just jam through this last little section here. I feel that way, too, but, like, I never know what sound effects I want to do. I feel the same way about, like, my phone. Oh, but here, here's, here's like, one. Like, you know, when you get that error, boom, you could have the... Uh, <laughs> the Windows screen. 95 one? No, you could have a dream from Spider-Man. Like, that, <gasps> that, like, meme one that everyone uses. Like, <laughs> It would be hilarious the first time and super annoying every other time. That's the point. Errors are meant to be annoying. Yeah. Like the boot up noise. You just find one of those videos where someone take or not the shutdown noise. You those videos that's like the um the Windows Windows XP shutdown sound but it's like really ob ob obnoxiously loud and you use that instead I, I just turn my computer into a meme machine honestly it'd be funny i once had a ringtone that was like a, a nuclear siren and like i had to i had to change it after some time because it would stress me out every time it would go off i had the geico one from that really old commercial where like ring a ding ding dong. And I had that one on my phone. And it was kind of embarrassing in public, I'll admit. Okay. Oh, man. I'm about done with this. I just wanted to get just some all these in there, these straights with the different. And then I was just curious if I just turned on boop and positioned them different. You know what I mean? In fact, what if I take these? And duplicate because I wanted to show you, John, that you don't always have to do it one way, right? So, what if I take these layers, let's transform them, let's flip them the opposite way. And let me move the one on the left now will become the one on the right. And then let's come here and make this one the one now on the left. And um, take the one on the right. I'm going to try to stretch it a little bit more, put it a little bit more of a tilt, cover part of that foreground. Yeah, I like that. I like that one pointy rock there. So I want to keep it about there. And I actually, to be honest with you, doing it this way, I felt less stress trying to squeeze in the drawing. Does that make sense? Try. Mm -hmm. I, I'd, I'd really like, if you guys don't mind, try that instead. Try doing this other approach instead of drawing around the plants, you know, what's important sometimes is, did you get to that successful outcome that you wanted, right? And if you get there, that's all that matters. Did you get there and did you make it work and did you get a better composition? So what I'm going to do now, is I'm just going to try this real quick. I'm going to come back into layer two here. And actually, let me try this. If I can put these on the same layer. And if I select them, no, it's not going to do the line. I was wondering if I could select them without erasing them. Let me just try to erase real quick. And then it's 9 o'clock. Um, we're not going to have time for a break, so I'll just jump into doing the reviews here. Hold on. Where's my – oh, I hate caps lock. So let me just come in here. I might have asked this. What? Uh, I might have asked this for, on the first day of class, but I'm just going to ask it again because it came to mind. Yeah, what's that? Will there be a project in this at some point where you would maybe possibly teach us, you know, photo bashing? Or no? Not in this class. Ah, this correct. is a drawing class. This is a drawing from imagination with an emphasis in organics and some props. I was going to do photo bashing. It would be dart and not art. Yeah. And yeah. I don't, I mean, I could do something like that later or have a, uh, John, that's another discussion for uh, YouTube, right? Yeah, that, that's John true. keeps that's asking true. me these cool questions. And then we were talking the other night and I'm all, John, 
you just gave me an idea. I'm like, what if we do a YouTube, you and I, like a live stream, and you ask me the questions, and then I do the drawing or show you how to fix it, or I fix your painting and your composition. How about we do that, you know? And it actually was a good I'm idea. I think it would, one of my goals for you guys, the students, besides, I'm trying to fill two sketchbooks this semester. I'm, I'm about 25% through one and halfway through another. And uh, one of them is going to be all in watercolor. And then I thought to myself, I want to start doing more videos on YouTube and build an audience. Because one thing that's been happening at school is cool. our classes are getting harder to fill. And if I create more of an audience, that's just going to work for me in the future because I really love, I enjoy teaching. I really love getting to draw. I love having, watching students grow and watching them get jobs. And it, it's really rewarding to me to know that I got to be a part of somebody's background, you know? So. Well, honestly, I mean, if you want more people to join your classes, tell the tell California or whatever to lower the cost of uh, out of state tuition. I know. I, that's a, a California stupid thing where it's so funny because we talk about debt, you know, all these things about providing for the students, diversity, equity, inclusion. It's like, okay, diversity, equity, inclusion is not something that happens only in the state of California. How about making college affordable to everybody of all races and all backgrounds and all nationalities, right? And, and how many kids, I mean, here's the thing. How many kids are there from tons of states? And, you know, I always think of Phil Mendez. Phil Mendez, here's that video with him and Mike uh, Mike Sheehan interviewed. Phil Mendez is an African-American guy from the Mississippi. Um, he was one of my directors. He's one of the kindest, best human, bestest of human beings I've ever met. It was super nice. He would just, like, call him in his office and he would draw. And I remember telling him once like, yeah, I, I could never be a character designer. And he'd be like, well, why can't you be a character designer? You, he goes, that's because you made that belief. And he goes, when did you, and he was one of those people that meant a lot to me that would say stuff to me. Like, when did you let other people make this decision for you? Like, and he used to tell me like, I was a poor black boy from Mississippi. And he goes, who liked to draw? What are the chances of a poor black boy from Mississippi being able to learn more about art, learn more about design, come up, move all the way to California, do a bunch of sketches, get a job working under the nine old men, then go work at Disney Imagineering for years, then go work under directly under uh, Johanna and Bill Barbera at HB, be there for the next 20 something years, go back to Imagineering and have this beautiful long wonderful career making shows and doing that what are the chances of that happening and by the way part of that conversation that we were talking about how many people told him no so you're right I, it does bother me john because to me it should be this is something that should be available for everybody but in that context i got a little burned out when i found out this company was trying to steal my lectures on drawing and perspective and make a book out of them and then they confronted me on making the book and their deal was like super shitty it was a 98 percent two percent deal i said no that's ridiculous i'm not going to do that it's you know anyway what do you guys think about that one another approach right another yeah. educational approach still we're building world we're still dealing with organics what i try to do on this this is my idea when i started go completely against the grain go completely into straights against these curves and then have a structure up there by itself, not complicated. And there was something really fun about getting to do this sketch because in this sketch, I got to sort of avoid trying to cram everything around the plants. You guys saw me. I was just hacking out trees, putting them at different angles, filling them in. And I, I actually like how this sort of came out. This would be to me a great thumbnail. So um, I had a lot of fun. I got to do four sketches tonight with you guys, and I really enjoy doing this. If you guys are cool, I'd like to do this from now on. I would like us to do our main crits on Tuesdays, and then Thursdays I get to demo for you guys. You know, I think that'd be really cool. And if you guys are cool with it, I'd like to even post this up on YouTube. I don't think you guys would mind. 
technically it's my property and I can do what I want with it. <laughs> I heard that today in faculty said it. I heard someone mention like when an instructor does a demo, the intellectual copyright of that demo belongs to the instructor. So it's your experience from drawing and sketching and being in a in anything, whether it be a sketchbook, drawing in seventh grade, drawing spaceships, drawing aliens, all that comes out and comes together, you know? So anyway. Well, I'd say it was also a pretty good conversation too. It, it is fun. I enjoy getting to talk with you guys because I think one of the things I've always wanted to do as a teacher is just make you realize that I'm just as human as you are. And I've gone through ups and downs and tribulations and, and been around negative people and naysayers and people that told me that, oh, you only be this, you only do this. And it's like, no, you can only, you, you are only limited to what your imagination tells you to be. And it doesn't matter. I'm really big about this thing. It doesn't matter what your ethnicity is. It doesn't matter what you identify as. None of that stuff matters. What matters is how you believe in yourself. And you got to have what I call heart, you know, have heart and believe in yourself, be confident in yourself, set goals and, and, and go forward. You know, I, you know, I, I know, so I feel like society is all turned around and upside down and everyone is all over the place. And it's like, dude, just be confident in yourself, be respectful to others and just sit and believe in yourself and apply yourself. You know, like I, I, I really like this expression. I was telling a couple of students, when's the last time in your life you dedicated one year to yourself of drawing, sketching and filling up the sketchbook? When's the last time you practiced scheduling? When's the last time you didn't watch something on Netflix and went to bed early and got up and drew two pages in a sketchbook? When's the last time, and I can answer this question for Ashley and for Claire uh, and for a couple other students in here in Cormac and Taha, right, and John, um, when's the last time you dedicated an extra hour or two to your homework to come up with more designs and push yourself on that envelope? And when you do that, Every one of those students I just mentioned are developing, and Raphael, too, in June, are developing these awesome portfolio pages. Will, the work you just submitted the other day was like, like it was spot on in class. I was like blown away by it. You did a great job. So I don't know, that's, that's where I leave it at is dedicate a little bit more of your time. I'm going to save this real quick and go download our work, okay? Um. Was that helpful for you guys? <clears throat> Absolutely. Cool. Super helpful. What I'll do is come back then next class after we look at stuff. My goal will then be to take my sketches or your sketches and do tonal studies of them. Okay. So that's my goal for next Thursday, which thank God I won't be all day in school for <laughs> six in the morning straight down. I'll be able to take a little bit of a nap, but um, I'll show you guys. Next class, I'll show you how to make Greek coffee. And then you can make some Greek coffee. It's really cheap and you can get energized and sit here and we can draw together, you know? Wait, so are you saying, stuff. are you saying great coffee or Greek coffee? Greek, Greek, oh, Greek okay. coffee. It's really easy to make. Cool. It's known as frappuccino. Or frappe. We call it, it's like frappuccino and it's just simple. It's easy. You shake it, pour it. I'll show you guys how to make it. You can buy it for like 10 bucks at Costco, the little base bottle. Nest Cafe, and then you can make it. One bottle will last you like a year. That's how great it is for $10, okay? All right, let me minimize this. And uh, I'm going to go download the work right now. Um, Does it have to be hot? I've never liked hot. It burns. No, it's so cold. Much. It's a cold coffee drink. Oh, it's great. Oh, you drink it on ice. Oh, man. <laughs> drink it on <laughs> ice with a little bit of milk. And it's it's... I'll show you guys how to make it. It's really... Once you make it once, you'll be like, dude, where have I been and why have I not been making it all the time? It's literally that delicious. And what we do in Greece with it is you sit around and you make it and like people hang out and smoke cigarettes and talk at a cafe or you play Metaboli, which is like backgammon. You sit around and you all play backgammon or other games together and you just get a coffee buzz and just, you know, when I would, but when I would go back, I would always want to be in a sketchbook or draw or look people watching or something. You know what I mean? That was always a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. All right, let me get the Google Drive up. What happened to Google Drive? I think I closed it. Let me open it again. Uh, hopefully everyone's work is up there and we can do sort of a nice little speed crit for everything. Let me go to 1, 243. Yeah, you know what's weird? We are talking about art and design and everything. And 
and drawing and these ups and downs. Something happened to me, I don't know, about a year and a half ago where um, I had a student who lodged a complaint to the dean that I wasn't give, giving enough time in class for people to draw. And the dean <laughs> called me what? up and said, like, maybe you shouldn't be doing as many critiques or as many demos and give the students more time. And I don't know, it, it's sort of what, what bugged me about it, because I feel like we have this weird society where one person complains and then it changes it for everybody else. And the problem is, I made a comment to the, it was our, our old dean real quick, and I just sort of said, I made a comment and I said, well, I said, what did what did the other 19 people say? And he was, he's a cool dean, sort of put his head back and he goes, it's a really good point. And he goes, the other 19 people didn't say anything bad. And I'm like, so, you know, I don't know. It, then it, but then it gets me thinking as a teacher, like, oh, I'm talking too much or doing crits too long or talking about other things about life that I shouldn't. And so, I don't know, it just got me, like re you reassess your your situation oh. sometimes. Does that make sense? If if this is like I don't know if I'm the only one that does it, but most of the time when you're drawing, I'm drawing along. So that's what I figured. Yeah. I don't do that. I just talk to you and watch, and then when you're done, I just like all right, work time. <laughs> right. Okay. And, and the yeah. fact that you you give us like all semester to like work like no other teacher does that so that's pretty yeah, awesome. i'm sorry you cut out there to say that again to do what oh no i said that um the fact that you kind of give us oh, the whole semester to work and to catch up on the projects like not a lot of instructors do that well to, to me how do you learn from a crit then if you can't do that right yeah i, I never got that like um when i was as an undergrad and then even as a grad a couple of, you know, it's due today, and they get all like stuffy on you, and you're like, well, then how are you getting better? Like, how how do you get a crit and the projects due, and you don't have the chance to redo it and and, and do it? And then again, I always come back to this thing because I, I just had this conversation. I have a new student from San Jose, and I think I was telling you guys this who wants to go to a master's program, and I said, show me the instructors. I'm like, I want to see their sketchbook. And I still really believe that. Like, if if it's hard to take a class with somebody who doesn't draw, right? I mean, how are you learning? That's like me. I could get it in the aspect of like, I could take a class with Mozart and learn a ton about composition from him, and he wouldn't have to play because I know he's a genius, right? But I think it's different with drawing. With drawing when the instructor draws it gives you an idea it's a springboard it's a stepping board right and to me that's an important thing to do i think in my opinion and that's why i don't know i sometimes i will admit i've been a little too private where i don't share stuff now i've been starting to release more stuff on instagram and and then i have some environments that i did that were freelance ideas and stuff uh, I emailed one of the producers and said, hey, can I put up my comps on Instagram? And he just told me, wait to the new year, then the project will be done, and then you can do it. So I'm like, cool. So, you know, um, that's why I really want to start going back and taking a look at um, it. I want to get more involved with YouTube and just posting and all that stuff. You know, it, it just feels like a healthy thing to do. And you know what? I realized, too, there's always going to be a ne there's always a negative Nancy in a room, right? There's always someone who's going to complain. There's always someone who's going to be upset. And if they're going to be upset about something, I'm just, you just skip it and go to your thing and keep doing what you do. Okay. Will, I love your little guy tree right here. Your monster you. guy. That's pretty cool. He's like part built into the tree, sort of coming out alive. That's really fun. That's a nice little idea there. Thank okay. you. Um, you have a nice, very simple, fun design to the way that you draw, Will. Um, as we move forward, don't feel like you have to do something that's heavy realistic. You can keep your drawing stylized and fun, if that makes sense. Okay. <laughs> Does that make sense? 
Yeah, yeah. There, there's styles in drawing and cleanup. There are styles like when you look at Nickelodeon, there are different shows. There's different shows at Disney and like Disney XD, and you don't have to always. I draw a certain way that's over detailed sometimes. I like the looseness that you have here and just sort of the symbolism and the shapes. And I think that that there's something fun about that. And you can focus on just good line cleanup and simple separation of values and make something work on a, on a, on a sort of an elegant stylized version. And I think it would be fine, you know? Okay. These are, okay. These are fun. Thank you. And, and I just crack up when I see this because it reminds me of like a cartoon character that had the ham stuck on their head and they're walking around with like feet, you know what I mean? But yeah, I was kind of doing a bunch of meat trees on this page. I don't know what was that, but yeah. it works. It, it's fun, but to be honest, the ones I like is I like that guy. I like this guy. I think a bunch of these staggered in different sizes would be really cool. Um, I I like <laughs> I I like the meat tree. But I would simplify. It's almost too too much symbolism of meat. I might pull it back a little bit and change it a little bit. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, maybe it's, maybe it's cartoon. Like meat surrounded by flowers. And when the flowers go to blossom, the local natives come and they take all the the meat out. You know what I mean? So like a big flower, but like when it buds, it's a kebab <laughs> or something. Like it's like a... exactly. You know, <laughs> instead of having a hummingbird to it, you have this. That'd be a fun character. You have a big overweight meat-eating bumblebee with like a huge belly that's half see-through with intestinal juices digested in the meat and puts its little nose in there and sucks all the meat out you know what i mean so yeah yeah yeah, fun, yeah i can see that so have fun Thank moving you. ahead these are fun okay good job all right i like that character though a meat-eating uh bumblebee you know yeah all right Taha, that's so much. Oh, Taha, by the way, I just wanted to give you a personal thank you for sharing your brush. I really appreciate that and admire you for sharing like that. That's a cool thing to do. And um, thank you. And these are beautiful sketches here. They're really a lot of fun. Um, they're really unique in shape. The, the silhouette reads of them are very great. They're easy to read. And there's just a lot of, uh, there's a cool energy. There's all of them have a, a, a nice movement. It's a nice feel. I love this sort of pattern design where it almost feels like one large shape and then you've just subtracted negatives or out of it. I think that's great. That's, you know, um, a, a great way to work. Um, I was actually looking at radishes for that one, but good. then I ch started changing the shape. Like underneath it, it's it was literally just circles and I, I started adding. Radish. Yeah, I can see the radish yeah. in there. That's really a lot of fun. These are really great. And I love this, this sort of domed tree. It reminds me a little bit of that, you know, Ivan Earl fine art when he was doing this really decorative trees. And then he'd have these really cool California branches that you see like, you know, on those, those what do they call those trees on like the California coast from like Carmel and going upward? They have some in Pismo Beach too. They're like these, there's a name for them. They're these trees. Juniper? What are they called? Are they juniper trees or not? I don't know. They might be like a juniper. It's like a juniper pine or something, and they they curl and they and yeah, yeah. because of the ocean air that comes in, cools them down and allows them to absorb some moisture into the ground and into the the bark of the skin, and it keeps the tree from ever drying out. Anyway, this is quite wonderful. They're very nice. Okay, love the African tree. That feels fun to you. Um, you could take any of these and develop them and start mismatching them. Um, so I'm good job like do like a tree house because i was doing this i was like what if there were like houses in the tree or something gnomes gnomes could live there oh, there's yeah. a, a shortage of no, of affordable gnome living you know <laughs> so um yeah these are great very nice so these are wonderful this is too. The first page so I, I think that's a great idea thinking about dry landscape why not um we get it's so easy when we're drawing organics to think about leafy there are other organics in dry and desert landscapes that would also work too. So I think that's a very clever idea, you know, because um, you get some interesting shapes here and this dry landscape feel makes it feel like it could be a planet that has a really, really like hot season and it loses all its leaves. You know what I mean? Yeah. And um, imagine taking that and combining that with a hilly, rocky terrain, like on planet, on a foreign mm -hmm. planet like Mars somewhere or Kepler, you know? I think that'd be pretty cool. So, yeah. 
All right. Good job. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. All right. Very nice work. All right, Raphael. God, those are fun. Thanks. <clears throat> very, very inviting. Love your sketches. Uh, this is what I was wanting to do earlier. I, I, it's so funny because when I, I said, give me a minute, I'm going to pull something up. That, hold on, let me get to the screen. I want to go. That's what I pulled up. <laughs> I was, I had this idea of doing a skull in the bushes, but then I'm like, now nah, I can't get into it right now. I got to figure that out. And you did it there very successfully. Do you guys see the skull in there? Yeah. It took a minute. I see it. It's very cool. It is very cool. It's very nicely done. I think that is a really great rendition of sort of, I know at first I didn't see it either. And then I went back and I'm like, son of a bitch, <laughs> my little idea. And he put the he put the head in there and the skull and it really came out really nice. And you did it. I think what was really nice in the way that you did it is the way you combine the bushes into the outline of the skull. So you change the contour to be bushes. And then by bringing that mouth slightly over the edge, well, you know what would really top that off now is you got to have waterfall. a waterfall. Water. I was just thinking that. I thought about that earlier, especially when you were doing the waterfall. Yeah. Part. Cause that's what was, was a, in my yeah, head was it, that. And then you know what you got to do is you got to come in to like a, a part of it and have that lower mandibula, that lower part of the jaw, no. like <laughs> part, partly cracked and waters like going around it, you know? Oh, that's and, cool, yeah. and then there's like one tooth sticking out, you know, here and there's like a couple more in the back type of thing. And then you got to have it like cracked a little bit. Maybe, I don't know, maybe the other part of the jaw is like here. And there, there's, oh, another, cool. <laughs> there's another tooth That's and it's rad. sort of like etched around and then comes back. But, and then, oh, wait, we're not done yet, <laughs> right? Then you get in here and you're like, oh, wait a minute. What if this guy had like, like it's an alien jaw, right? Yeah. And then there's water dripping over it. And then there's another, maybe up here somewhere you see another weird looking or maybe not that's too devil like too much symbolism what if you see a like a rear spike or two coming out of the head so now it it changes it or what if it's in what if you're on an alien planet on kepler and you saw that thing right yeah and then you start thinking dude what was this thing right throw a third eyeball like somewhere and yeah <laughs> Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, there's a different version of it that I had worked on, but I could upload it for Tuesday. Yeah, so, dude, like, I, think, I think you have a real cool winner there. And to be honest, I don't think you need this one I put in the middle there. But I do got to admit that jaw opening like that just makes it look like, ah, you know what I mean? Look more menacing. Yeah, it does. It's like, because it makes you wonder, like, did the jaw go to here a little bit? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like this super long the road over. Yeah. Is it this beast like thing with spikes coming out of it or something cool, you know? So, um, yeah, at first I, I had just thought about like maybe a skull that was carved into the, the mountain face, but I like the idea of it having been like alive at some point and is now like rotting or like has long decayed. Yeah, and I like like these rock pointy rocks, and then you see the water like hitting the base, <laughs> billowing up back, and like little droplets of the water going everywhere. It would paint so nice. It's so cool to see that. That's a beautiful sketch. I like it quite a bit. Now that you did that, let me throw a curveball at you guys. What if you did it with like the skull of like a triceratops or uh, a raptor? You know. I was I was actually just working on one that had like a that's got like a dragon skull or something like that. There you so, go. Yeah. Dragons are all skull. Dra <laughs> dragons are right, just no necromancers. No, I'm just kidding. Well, this one's a dead dragon, so <laughs> yeah, that's okay. I'm just kidding. We like it was dragons. one that Phil killed. Right? Phil killed it. Or no that's dragons. Cool, dude. I I love that man. That really is very inspiring. You nailed it. That's a, a beautiful little home run hit there. Okay. So uh, oh, thanks. good job. Beautiful sketch. Let's take a look here. Uh, man, look at you. You already jumped ahead. You're already nailing it, buddy. Those are great. Thanks. 
yeah i had fun doing these yeah so and again i'm gonna say the word level up right there you are um that without a doubt that's a portfolio page i've been on a ton of productions where people cannot sketch something like that do you mind if i ask you how long that took you um to do all of these these aren't really like sketch these are the trees that i made I put them together i just compositionally put them in and some of the sketches already had like a light background and uh -huh. together it kind of just met yeah um i think these are awesome dude they read and so the fact this is sort of what my goal was with this assignment is you create these wonderful plants because here's the thing i really believe this is a teacher when you throw somebody in the mix of one large assignment we get overwhelmed but if you break it into like little pieces and parts and you have someone build a model first or you have them you know build up to something and by doing the plants thinking about them giving you guys complete freedom then to start to merge them together and then the, my next idea was let's introduce a light source now coming from left or from right and then get in there and start toning them with times of day uh we're, we're producing a really wonderful organic environment which could then later could be adapted for a narrative you can introduce characters in there you could have mechs walking around you could have a castle in the back you can have two characters talking in the front you know look, one looking at a watch one looking at a map trying to figure out where they are and to me that is really like an important skill set that i when i looked at what the american illustrators were doing they were just doing these little sketches and little vignettes and they were building up little collections and then doing finished sketches then going into tone then going into paint and to me i, I think that's an important part and you're nailing it here so uh, excellent job okay thanks yeah I, I had never thought to like work in that way before i i used to always like if it was like an illustration yeah you got to kind of like build it up but working on like different pieces for it to come together like it it made it a lot faster yeah it does i really think it does and here's the great thing about this you have a plethora of, of organics and trees to go back and work with right and imagine if we did what we just did on structures now what if you made a structure like a castle an right. old hawaiian hut that not hawaiian i was thinking the uh what do you call it the guys in new zealand midori midori the midoris yeah the midori imagine they're a, a very a very strong civilization they made warrior warrior weapons they'd have one-on-one -on -one battles to the death imagine making like a civilization in a forest for them with all these cool cuts out of wood and this really cool like thing up on a hill and like you know what i mean it's it's to me that's where i was hoping this assignment might go a little bit so uh yeah would These you even be able to do that but what would you even be able to do that with structures? Because with organics, you can really fudge perspective. But with structures, like, you're right. if when you move you, it to perspective. Yeah, you're right. That's one of the hard things about moving in from, that's one of the great things about, to me, with organics is you get to, well, number one, we created all our plants based off of a horizon line. So we're keeping that rule of perspective there. But then the other big thing is with your, you just can't fudge and fake the organics you can get away with some murder with excuse me with, with the buildings you can't fudge and fake a structure at a certain angle or above the horizon line or on a cliff or an overhang you have to figure that out and make sure it's working yeah. correctly now what you could do is rough it in really quickly and have fun and come up with something cool then come back and clean it up and fix it that's how i would i would try to attack something like that you know but uh these are outstanding they're beautiful drawings and um yeah these are uh 100% portfolio pieces. So uh, thanks, Raphael, for the good work. Thanks, Bob. You know, I, I can't wait to see. It gets me so excited to see students take a class and they walk away with like 15 portfolio pages. It's just, you know, I just, you know, want to go home and have a beer, a shot of tequila, and a tri-tip. <laughs> I mean, it just gets me excited. So anyway, um, all right, let me pull up the other batch here. Good work. Ooh, uh, my stuff's not in there. Uh oh. Cormac. Oh no, never mind. I just forgot to name. <laughs> What'd you we'll do? Get... I mean, didn't we have that problem like... earlier? No, I'm just kidding. Just giving you a hard time. You know. Is it not in there? 
it it, it is in there. I just forgot to name it and didn't see it at first. My bad. That's all right. Uh, no all worries. Right. Hold on. What I do with Photoshop? Get back. All right, Latoya. Okay. Um. All right, Latoya. It's it's starting to come together. Is this your first time sort of crafting a composition like this? Uh, yeah, pretty much. Okay. Um, what I would recommend is try this. Try having sort of the dominant compositions on the foreground. Well, excuse me, let me rephrase that. Not dominant. I mean the biggest block shapes. And then try to get your focal point to the area you want us to look at either like Hold on a minute. Like right here or over here. If you do a dead center, that's okay. That can work. Because when I look at this piece, what happens is I battle a couple things. This becomes my focal point because it's the most interesting silhouette shape in the piece, which there's nothing wrong with. But it is sort of close to the foreground. and Usually, when we have a focal point, we want it to be sort of in the mid-ground or going towards the background. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then we want to use part of our foreground elements as either overlays or as elements that are darker than then lead us into something being lighter. Um, what I would do on this is I like this really twisty tree shape. I almost want to see another part of it blending in maybe behind it or maybe have another branch coming off and more of those shapes because then maybe that'll make it feel a little bit more a little stronger and a little thicker and more powerful okay if you get that in there then try moving that to the midground and then try enlarging some of these other shapes here in the foreground with some other trees and branches and then let that tree read and become its own dominant shape in the back. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And it will become the more dominant shape in the back because of this reason. The silhouette read here is that. The silhouette read here is that. If this is the most interesting silhouette read, that will be that will stay and always be the dominant read in the piece. But you're really close to the foreground here. If we move it back a little bit and we use these other foreground elements as staging elements, it'll read a little bit easier for you, okay? Okay. But you're going, you're on, you're on to the right direction. And I also like seeing this tree shape here too, because the canopy came out really nice. So I sent you the videos, right? Yeah. Did those help you seeing those? Yeah, it does. It helps a lot. Figure out some stuff. Okay. So I think if you're, coming back in here, I also would recommend maybe exploring that shape because I think it's really cool having these. You have something neat here where it's like large, like a like a hand on the ground, but then you have another hand going up, which is really cool. And I would love to see you explore that shape because that might turn into something really cool. And one of the things that'll, that I didn't get to do last class that I did in the demo today is now you get to see the play on opposites, right? So mm -hmm. if you have round curvy shapes in the front, try doing straight shapes in the back. And if you have straight shapes in the foreground, then try putting some curvy shapes in the back. Uh, that will help you also. You'll notice in here, one thing that'll happen is you have curves, 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 and curves. And because of that, the eye sometimes doesn't know where to land. And to, to give credit to two old teachers of mine, Robert St. Pierre, and then Cliff Crap once made this comment and said, if you have a series of squares like this in a composition, and you want to create a focal point, just put something opposite inside that composition. And what he was talking about is something that Edgar Payne talked about in some other landscape painters, which was, if you have a bunch of straights, throw a curve where you want the eye to go. And then the eye will go there because it'll be the different shape that stands out from everything else on the composition. Okay? Try that mm -hmm. a little bit with some of what I did today. 
And then if you get stuck on anything, let me know over the weekend and I can jump on sometime like on Saturday to take a look at anything that you have or sketch on top of it. Okay. Thank you. All right. Good job. Thank you. All right. And then here we have June. Wonderful. Hi. Sketches. I know those flowers. Those are great. <laughs> um, these are while I was um, earlier in the class, I was drawing earlier in the class. So <laughs> there's okay. not much in this page. So. That's all right. I know what you're capable of when you put your mind to it, right? I still love that bottleneck palm. That's just a fun plant to look at. That's, I love that being stylized, but don't fill in the black. Oh, okay. Because gotcha. the black value will turn it into a value read a positive and negative and just flatten it completely. But good stuff. Those are fun too. Are you doing, are you feeling okay on this assignment? Uh, yeah, I think I'm just kind of getting used to doing reference, like um, drawing things from like, my, <laughs> well, drawing uh, organics from imagination is a little bit more challenging than, you know, like characters. So um, it's just because uh, I'm not so familiar with drawing organics as much as characters. You know what I mean? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, yeah. You could treat some of the trees as if they're characters. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's challenging, but you know, yeah. it's. Well, you're doing yeah. great. These are beautiful <laughs> sketches. You can take anything here, start moving it around and build a world off of it, you know? And what I would encourage you to do is remember when I did the monster tree? Yes. I had, my goal was to have, um, where was it? Hold on a minute. Where'd he go? Oh, he's not in this one. Is it the killer plant one? Yeah, that. When I did killer plant, my goal was the radish with these legs that would look like spider legs with these large leaves that my animator moved. They would be oversized leaves that are on a standard little... Um, a little bush tree I have in my backyard, if that makes sense. So I combine I combine three plants to come up with something different. Don't be afraid to do that and and go to that level and see what you okay. come up with. Okay. All right. Okay. And same thing. If you have any questions, let me know. I can jump on or see you. Uh, if you're, you're going to go to the drawing event Friday, I'll be there. Oh, just a reminder: some of you that might be new. We have our Friday drawing event at school tomorrow from 6 to 9 p.m. It's free. We have a costume figure drawing model available. You feel free to come draw with us, and then we'll have some pizza there. And I'll be there, too. So if you do any sketches and want to show them to me, you, you can come up and uh, show me your work. Okay? All right. Good job, June. Thank you. Thank you. Also, I, I kind of had a question. So yeah. when you say, like, think of the organics as characters, would you? <laughs> I, I'm thinking, like, do we think of, like, personality traits <laughs> for these organics you know, or like what I know. mean by that is this you know how like when we're in character design you might have a character that's like this and they have a belly and you might have a character who's thick as an ox who's in that shape right and you might have a character that's top heavy with a chest and legs right oh, okay see what i'm getting at yeah this guy might have like huge forearms hang down the ground like a like a gorilla you know um you might have somebody might have a woman who is a, a real like gestural figure eight body so we have all those shapes that represent characters right and we talk right. about pushing those shapes and squashing and stretching. Do the same thing with the tree. Take the tree and squash and stretch that out and then taper it in real quick. Get that energy in it. Move that energy. Move those branches. Stretch them out across. You know? Oh, okay. Don't, yeah, you know, I see what you mean. You know how we taper a character? You taper a hand or fingers or the body or an arm. You know, yeah. you might take an arm on a character and it's attached and that arm might be like really heavy here. And then when it comes down to like the elbow, they have like short like this and they have these big thick, like 
like sausage finger hands. You know what I mean? Yeah. Do that, but do that with a tree branch. Oh, okay. Yeah, you I know? get what you mean. Yeah. You bring out this really thick tree branch, and all of a sudden it ends, and instead of fingers, they're little branches like this, and then it holds a sagging uh, top to it, if that makes sense. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. Cool. That, Thanks, that, you. That's what I do a lot of times. I just think of the trees as being in the shape of a person, and I modify squash or stretch that and somehow, you know. Okay. Have fun with it. All right. Thank you. Right. Of course. Thank you, June. All right. These are Cormax, right? Yeah. Okay. One day I'll remember to name my file. I like this sort of looking mushroom pancake tree thing. That's cool. Yeah. That's like something it. pretty neat. You you give me the idea there of what if these are literally like layers that grow out and then when it gets yeah. to the bottom of the tree, they fan down. And then maybe when it gets higher, they're literally like more stacked on each other. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like melt like pancakes. Uh, you know, cool. I like that, and I like I'm that. Trying to think of what I would do. Yeah. What I like about this is I have this cool canopy in nature that then protects the growth of all the little ones underneath. So yeah. there could be other. Yeah, I, could, I should include ones. like little tiny. Yeah, and they start to grow and they're protected, you know, from growing under there, and then you have another one that maybe comes up and maybe that falls behind a little bit and that's my current thing is just trying to figure out like how many of my like thumbnails I, or like my plants that i've made would be able to fit into a good thumbnail like, just for variety well, without like looking like a bajillion different aesthetics. and start having fun with it and i'm sure you'll come up with a good answer fair and I think you'll be fine. Yeah. I'm having fun now thinking of this idea yeah. that you have these branches with these little fungus, other little fungus caps growing, and this is the protective cap around it. Maybe yeah. this emits a dripping slime that anything that comes it next to it gets up. paralyzed because it protects everything in the middle, you know? Okay. Yeah. Nicely done, sir. That's fun. Um, I like this idea with all the circles, but find a way to group that if you can. Otherwise, yeah. you'll have all these floating circles, and it'll become super duper busy. Um, but yeah, that's going on a cool path. These are fun shapes, too. Because I like thinking of how the canopy would interact, of what's canopy, what's top. Um, and they almost feel like somebody trying to do the, the mamba. They're like trying to go under the bar, and they're like leaning back. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's a, a neat, a neat figure shape in there with the tree. Okay, all right, okay. good job. Keep plugging away, buddy. If you get stuck on anything, let me know. Will do. All right, thank you, sir. And Ashley, I love it. Hi, Phil. Hi, that's beautiful up there. That's gorgeous. It's wonderful. Thank you. I I kind of hurt my wrist a little. It's getting better. It's getting better, but kind of like. What'd you My do? hand slipped on the doorknob, so that I was like, oh, oh. The pain. <laughs> All you got to do is just take Motrin. It'll reduce the swelling. Don't pick up anything heavy with it. And, you know, once the swelling goes down, your body will heal it a lot better. So um, okay. these are really wonderful. There's a lot of movement in there. It's a lot of fun. Um, these are great, Ashley. They're very nicely done. Excellent. Thank you. And I was going to tell you something that I just wanted you to think about. When I was your age, I could not draw organics like this at all. When I was just getting out of school, you know, I really didn't learn too much. And I was having to like rebrand my, re retrain myself, excuse me, figure out how to draw certain things. I mean, this is better than stuff I've seen thumbnails and roughs coming out from people that work in the industry. So keep doing okay. what you're doing. It's, it's really gorgeous. Okay. Thank you, Phil. All right, my pleasure. All right, anyone else?
forget to put work up. You know what's funny is I wanted to turn all these on and see what it looked like. <laughs> it's like oh. crazy, crazy nonsense, you know what I mean? When I'm old and like 90, I'm just going to be going like this and just drawing all kinds of weirdness on a piece of paper. Anyway. Um, I don't know. I mean, like you could like totally go up against Jackson Pollock with that. <laughs> I know, right? Maybe come up with something. I, I don't know why I have the forgot who I wrote that on. I Better than the stuff you see in modern art exhibits. No, you know what? There, there's a, um, there's a place for, for good design. I've seen good design in fine art. I've seen good balance and composition. Um, you know, it, it's just, I, I mean, then I've seen some things that I'm not a fan of. I, I mean, I'm not a fan of, of really pushed, you know, mocha museum of contemporary art stuff. I, you know, but then I've seen other things that are really cool. You know, so I, I don't know. It's it's just a balance. You know, you got to make it, you know, like I know Rothko's work. I mean, it evokes an emotion in you. I've seen some really cool stuff. So I don't know. Everyone has a different take on it. And what I what I really enjoy is getting to we, we get to work on becoming storytellers in some frame of mind, whether it be drawing environment, drawing a prop, doing an illustration. It all contributes to the same thing. It's all about building up storytelling and skill sets and i think that's the important thing to look at you know i mean um i will say this i admire people that sculpt and i love looking at sculpture especially sculpture done in stone i think that is just a, an amazing talent and i've seen especially figurative artists that do that and i've even seen some really cool abstract stuff come out of people that's a blend of both figurative and abstract that looks really fantastic so anyway um all right guys i'm going to stop the recorder um so as far as homework what i wanted you to do um i think i was asking you to do three different versions of what i did with different um three different fronts if that makes sense so that way you do some trial and error and i would do a minimum of two of each so i would say six thumbnails so what I mean by fronts, two different trees or two different versions where you like you draw the back or excuse me, I'm going to make it confusing. Six thumbnails, but three of them should be like the same trees in the foreground or the same background with you manipulating stuff around. So however you want to interpret that, just try to have six little thumbnails that are all done that are different that push you along a different direction. Okay. Have fun with it. Um, try to keep them like two by six in thumbnail size. I always draw larger on my canvas because, you know, I'm I'm working and I want you to be able to see the lines of what I'm addressing in terms of a demo, you know. And, um, oops. So, um, hold on, where did my mid-ground go? There it is. So when I'm doing something, it's, I do it a little bit larger because someone asked me that. They're like, Phil, why do you want us to draw smaller when you always get to draw bigger? And I'm like, yeah, but I'm drawing bigger because for demo purposes, I want it to be seen easier on the screen. I think I deleted that layer by accident. You know that? It's gone. No worries. I need to go in and it's too busy talking and I didn't label some of those correctly. So two was there. Hold on. What did I do? Did I lose it? I had mid-ground in there. Which was cool. Oh, you know what? That's a different background. That's why. I didn't even think about that. That's a totally different background with a different set of trees. That wasn't for the ones. I believe that one was for the twos. Nope. Anyway, I'm going to confuse myself. I got to go figure it out. It you was have... for those. Huh? It was flipped. Your, your foreground trees were flipped in that first one. Is that what I did? Let me go back and check it real quick. Oh, so they weren't, there were these. No, nope. hold on, let me delete that layer. That's bugging me. No, the, the trees foreground are the right trees. It's just you mirrored, flipped them. I mirrored them, but I didn't, oh yeah, that's right. So I need, I didn't duplicate the layer. That's what I did, huh? Mm -hmm. I thought I duplicated it. Yeah, I did duplicate it. So 
I think, okay, hold on a minute. Let me, I'll figure this out. I need to label them like that was version three. And then this drawing here in the background. See, this is what happened. I'm too busy talking. And then I did that one and that matched up. That was version three. So let me turn out version three. And then I did version one, which were these, these, and that one, and that one, and then the midground. Yeah, that's what I did. So that's my bad. I'm, so I'm going to label all these and call these um, one, 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 and one. And then what I did is I took off part of that background in the very back. Yeah, that's right. Now I can go in and adjust it because now I can look at my sketch, change it, and then modify it. And then what I did is then I put the twos in there on a different layer. So if I take off the ones, I kept the two in there. But when I did the two, I think I kept the original ones in there. Yep, one there, and I kept that one there. That's what I did. So I'm going to duplicate those and call those twos. And see, that's important, the layer management, right? Bill sort of forgot about that. I was too busy talking in the demo. And now if I turn off those ones, then that makes sense. That was twos. Anyway, I'll figure that out. You guys, uh, oh, real quick, I had the roll sheet up. Let me take roll. Totally zoned out. Uh, log me out again. Hold on a minute. One minute. I got to get back into it. Give me a second. Let me stop the recorder. 